Okay, thank you, everyone. We'll be getting started in about two minutes. We're just switching out the recorders. And we're back. So the first panel we will hear from is the uh, NYCHA resident panel, along with um, Legal Aid Society. So Mr. Danny Barber, the chair of the Citywide Council of Presidents. 
Ms. Carmen Quiones, Douglas Houses, and Ms. Lucy Newman from the Legal Aid Society. Good afternoon. Um, my name is Lucy Newman. I'm a staff attorney at the Legal Aid Society. I wanted to thank uh, the committee and especially the chair uh, for your commitment to public housing residents in New York City and also for holding this important uh, oversight hearing. Um, so in New York City, every residential lease has what's called an implied warranty of habitability, uh, which says that a tenant's obligation to pay rent is dependent on the landlord providing them with safe and habitable housing. Um, in New York City, the New York City Administrative Code um, obligates a landlord to provide water 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and um, heat between October the 1st and May 31st in what we call the heating season. Uh, this is what is probably one of the most basic fundamental obligations of a landlord, and indeed, uh, the former chairperson of NYCHA, uh, Ms. Olatoye, said that before this committee last year, she said, that providing basic services like heat and hot water go to the heart of NYCHA's responsibility as a landlord. In January of 2018, Legal Aid started getting many, many phone calls from residents in NYCHA developments who were without heat and hot water. Uh, and then before this very committee in February, uh, NYCHA admitted that it had indeed violated the law and violated its obligation to provide heat and hot water and failed at its most basic job as a landlord. Um, I think you mentioned they said that 80% of their housing units had experienced outages, which was affecting about 323,000 residents. We know from hearing um, from other residents and also things that we've read in the news about just how awful the circumstances were for residents, uh, thousands of them were forced to endure uh, freezing conditions in their apartments, many during which uh, happened during the coldest spell uh, in New York City's uh, recent history. Uh, Tenants told stories about how they had to bundle layers and layers of clothing, sleep their entire families in the bed in order to keep warm, uh, use blankets, and then many of them resorted to using their stoves to keep warm. Uh, bearing in mind that the, the NYCHA's own resident handbook that they distribute to residents says and warns residents to, quote, never use your stove to heat your apartment. Poisonous carbon monoxide gas has no smell, builds up, and is deadly. Yet they knowingly failed to provide heat and hot water and forced residents to do exactly what they were warning them that they shouldn't do, putting people's lives at risk. Um, you also mentioned that in response to this, in January, the city announced the allocation of $213 million to provide immediate fixes and then fixes over the course of the, of the summer, um, and they made statements about what they were going to do with that money. Um, notably, from January, from those two announcements until October 18th, absolutely nothing was said publicly by NYCHA uh, to the public or to their own residents about what they were doing to ensure that in this heat season and this winter they were going to provide adequate and reliable heat. Uh, last week, there was a press conference uh, including a tour of a new boiler at Wald Houses in which they um, laid out some of the things that they'd done over the course of the summer. And then, astonishingly, the very next day, the entire development of Wald was out without heat and hot water in an unplanned outage. Uh, we have been reviewing every single day, multiple times a day, uh, the uh, self-reported outages that NYCHA has uh, on their website. And from October 18th to the 23rd, um, they have uh, re recorded that 33,000 individuals have already experienced an unplanned heat or hot water outage. And that is just in the space of one week. Um, so uh, again, we want to thank the committee for having this hearing. Obviously, what we do know at this point is that the statements that NYCHA is making publicly have been belied by the evidence that they themselves are putting up on their very own website about outages. Residents deserve to know what has been done with the money, um, how NYCHA is going to ensure that they provide adequate and reliable heat and hot water this season, um, and make sure that, NYCHA, that NYCHA's residents are safe in their very own homes. And we also implore the city again to provide more funding so that NYCHA can upgrade their infrastructure and make the very, very needed uh, fixes to their heat and hot water systems. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Ms. Newman. Mr. Barber. Well, good morning, Madam Chair, committee members. Um, as the Citywide Council of Presidents Chairman, I am honored to, that I have been given the opportunity to testify before this committee. 
regarding the heating situation at NYCHA. We were here in the same position as we were last year, and the only difference is the the only difference is the year, and we are still faced with heating outages and closing tickets because you restored the plant, but no one went to assure that all the units were restored and report that reported the outages. Madam Chair, last year you stated at the hearing on oversight and public housing with this with this being stated how it was unacceptable leaving the residents in the dark or the cold. You also spoke of the basic responsibility of heat and hot water being provided to the residents but wasn't being done and the residents agreed. Last year there were 320,000 residents who went without heat and hot water and now we are at the beginning of the heating season this year and we already faced with 4,000 residents of Queens, Queensbridge houses reported by the New York Post on October the 19th that are affected by service interruptions and they have new equipment. We had the coldest day thus far last week and the call center went down and residents couldn't put in work orders. So I used social media to get the outages reported to NYCHA for repairs for two days. Or we can go up to the South Bronx to the Patterson houses who for the past five years or more been provided been providing heat by mobile boilers which are old and needing replacement but were fully funded for new boilers and there has been nothing to this current day. Or we can look at Morrisonia Air Rights where steam leak repair was held up because the Yankees made the playoffs and didn't resume till they were eliminated. All this shows that the residents of public housing aren't respected and are not treated as if they are people that count. And this statement presented today is very similar to the statement given at the hearing last year with the mentioning of the same developments. NYCHA isn't ready for the heating season, in my opinion, as well as you know and see. As this tragedy and lack of service plagued us last year, there were developments that were slated to receive new equipment and that has yet to happen. But the mayor stated that the heat would be fixed in July, but nothing happened. So the residents are asking for better accountability with the formulating of a monitoring committee along with residents and council and the city council to provide basic services and to correct the violations of basic human rights. Again, thank you for the opportunity to be heard by this committee, Daniel Barber. Thank you so much, Mr. Barber. And I know that we were on the phone several times over the weekend. Um, so thank you for your leadership and um, uh, just providing us with some information that we would not have been able to receive from NYCHA. Thank you. Ms. Kionis. Um, first, let me say thank you again for your leadership um, for the people of public housing. Um, it's <laughs> It's just a shame that we're here again, just a year later. The only thing that's changed is that Shola has a new job. <laughs> when one of us or any of us that committed the crimes that she did will be under the jail. She has a good job right now, real estate. It's exactly what they want. Privatization, privatization, privatization. I am the president of Douglas Houses, but I get calls from every other development. Yesterday, Jefferson Houses, no heat, no hot water at all. Corsi House, which is a senior center on the east side, also called me. Residents there, the, the seniors, had no hot water at all. How long are we going to keep going on with the same thing? And let me tell you what's gonna happen. It's until the, the resident engagement is changed, until the people that are at the realm of this have changed, it's not gonna happen. You cannot just take people, put them in different departments, and think this is, this is over. It is not. You cannot just take people and replace them somewhere else and think that this is not gonna go on. The same corporates are in NYCHA, NYCHA housing. 
Well, I mean, let me tell you something. I, I'm, I, and I want to say this publicly. I like Vito. I think Vito's on the ground. I think he can make a big difference. But until the people in resident engagement are changed and everywhere else are actually, and I'm talking about dismissed, this is not going to change. Right now, because of, of, of my, I call it leadership, maybe somebody else calls it trouble, but I call it leadership, because I have been a leader in, in what is happening in public housing, I am now being attacked with my presidency. Um, you know, <laughs> They're, they're not uh, acknowledging my presidency now. They're staying, uh, we cannot get any TPA funds. I cannot have an office. All this is retaliation because we've been a voice here. Um, the first time I got elected, I had to run four times. Four times my residence was subject to elections. And each time it came out the same. I won by a landslide, okay? It's happening again. Listen, I ain't, got a, I ain't got an issue with having another election, but I do have an issue of people taking advantage of my people. That, I have, I, the injustice is just too much already, okay? Now, um, it's, it's a shame that we are here a year later, a year later, and we still got the same outages, and nobody, I mean, come on. How long is this gonna go on? And when are people going to be held accountable, accountable for criminal negligence? This is inhumane, it has to stop, and until these people are out of here, out of New York City Housing Authority, nothing is going to change. I don't care what you do, Alicia, it's not gonna change. They gotta go. It's plain and simple, they got to go because what they do is they retaliate against the people that are defending their residents, that were chosen by the residents. And this has got to stop. It's really, it's just overwhelming, it pisses me off. You know, it really pisses me off that we keep doing the same thing over and over and over. And what's gonna happen now is that next week is gonna be freezing cold and I'm gonna get 20,000 calls. I got bags under my eyes, I'm tired. I'm a person that suffers from lupus. Any little up thing that upsets me, my lupus acts up. How long is this gonna continue to go on? And until somebody goes to jail, I am not gonna be satisfied, I'm sorry. I'm not. You got kids with lead. You got people living in conditions that are inhabitable. And nobody's going to jail, but yeah, they're getting million dollar contracts, they're getting million dollar jobs, and we're sitting here living on poor, in poor conditions. Do you think that's really fair? How long will we have to do this? and how many meetings, and how many hearings, and how many things we're gonna have to keep going through to get the message. I'm asking Vito to check out resident engagement, find out what's happening with them TPA funds, and why they don't wanna give us our money. And I demand an overhaul of the TPA and my election. It has to be looked into. They keep taking our money like it's nothing. And it's not their money. It's the resident money. They get money for each apartment. How dare they think they can do what they want with that money? I'm just so sick of it. I, I, I'm so sick of it. I'm sick of them. I'm sick of all of it. And you know what? The ones that are suffering are our seniors and our children. And that, my dear, is unacceptable. And I thank you again. And I'm sorry I'm getting carried away, but this just, the shit's got to stop. Thank you, Ms. Quiones. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And I just want to emphasize why we have the resident panel before the agency is because we need to hear the voices of the people. We need to hear the voices of the people. And the purpose of today's hearing is to make sure that NYCHA is prepared 
as we go into the heating system. And if they're not, we need to figure out how. So as we transition, NYCHA will um, be the next panel. And I know that there are some slides or some um, charts that you wanted to display. And so um, NYCHA, you can come forward. So the first NYCHA panel will include the general manager, Vito Mustachulo, executive vice president for capital projects, Deborah Goddard, Kathy Pennington, executive vice president for operations, as well as Javier Almodavar, director for heating. And we have been joined by council member Perkins, and Council Member Van Bramer. And Council Member Richie Torres. Is everyone ready? Okay, would you please raise your right hand? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to all council member questions? Thank you. <coughs> you can begin. Chair Alika and Paris Samuel, members of the Committee on Public Housing, and other members of the City Council. Good afternoon. I am Vito Mustachulo, NYCHA's General Manager. I am pleased to be joined by Kathy Pennington, NYCHA's Executive Vice President for Operations, Deborah Goddard, Executive Vice President for Capital Projects, and Javier Amaldalvo, our newly appointed Director of Heating Management Services Department. Delivering essential services, such as heat and hot water, are at the heart of NYCHA's responsibility as a landlord. As a part of our next generation NYCHA mission, we are changing the way we do business to become better landlords for our residents. We have recently brought on board a new Senior Vice President for Operations, Support Services, Joey Koch, whose responsibilities include overseeing the management of heating systems at NYCHA. With new leadership at the helm, including Interim Chair Stanley Bresnoff, we have undertaken significant steps to improve heat and hot water services for our residents. Thank you for this opportunity to discuss these efforts today. Last winter presented the longest stretch of below freezing days the city has experienced in nearly 60 years. The failures in our equipment put a spotlight on the unfortunate rea reality that we have been discussing for years, that NYCHA's aging infrastructure has been starved of the investment and resources it most desperately needs. A $3 billion reduction in federal funding since 2001 has contributed to a nearly 32 billion backlog in capital improvement needs. Despite the magnitude of these issues, NYCHA remains committed to doing as much as we can with the resources that we have, including making operational improvements that enable us to restore service as quickly as possible. We are thankful that Mayor de Blasio has stepped up to help us begin to tackle the significant challenges. He committed $13 million in January and an additional 200 million shortly thereafter for our heating systems, money we are putting to good use in advance of this coming winter season. Here are some of the actions that we have taken since last winter to improve heat and hot water services at NYCHA. <coughs> we performed annual preventative maintenance on our heating equipment, including making welding repairs and repairs to boiler controls. We have overhauled 1,918 boilers citywide or 98% of uh, our existing boilers in preparation for this heating season. The remaining 48 boilers are currently undergoing repairs and we fully expect to have those completed by the first week of November. During the heating season, as the weather gets colder, we will increase the number of off-hours personnel. These roving teams include supervisors, oil burner mechanics, electricians, and plumbers. We determined that new skills were needed for our heating response in addition to the positions that I've just mentioned. 
as part of a pilot program for this winter, we have added stationary engineers who can better diagnose and repair issues that affect service disruptions. Stationary engineers help NYCHA to immediately make the necessary repairs and thus lessen the time our residents are left without services. We've invested in heat-related improvements that target 87,000 residents. 12 heating plants have received new boilers with several receiving complete upgrades. Two more plants will receive replacements soon, meaning this heat season. New mobile boilers at six developments. We will also have five new mobile boilers that will be used for contingency for our vulnerable sites. And new window balances to help retain heat at our buildings for seniors. Uh, to date, we have accomplished 7,600 of those repairs. As of October 1st, 2018, heating plants at 41 developments are being serviced and repaired by third-party vendors, bringing the total to 46 developments. And an additional development is coming online later this year. When freezing temperatures are expected, we will be adding additional heating and emergency services staff, enabling faster repairs for residents. This includes permanent staffing lines for eight plumbers, eight plumber helpers, and six oilers. We've improved the way residents can report heat and hot water issues and enhanced the notification process after a service interruption through automated calls that allow for instant feedback from residents. This provides us more detailed information, enabling resident complaints to be identified and addressed quickly. We've accelerated the design process for nine heating plants funded for replacement by Mayor de Blasio, meaning that they'll come into service six months faster than is typical for such work. This past spring, we worked with the FDNY to streamline the notification process for staff whose certificates will be expiring. 274 staff have received their certifications to work in boiler plants. Long overdue technology improvements are helping NYCHA better connect with and serve our residents. Since last heating season, we have implemented multiple new measures with more coming online soon to speed our responses to service interruptions. For instance, we are digitizing boiler room inspections and fuel requests, which will provide real-time centralized updates on where repairs are needed and increase accountability. We've enhanced heat-related work order data, providing visibility into the root causes of several disruption of service disruptions. This allows staff to perform predictive and preventative maintenance and proactively address problems. We've improved the heating metric system by integrating data into one dashboard. This provides visibility into the functioning of the heating system and enables us to identify trends. The data informs preventative and predictive maintenance, improving the operation of heating systems and allowing NYCHA to provide better services to the residents. Our work to replace outdated boilers and modernize heat systems and controls in hot water making technology, sorry, in hot water technology uh, continues. Additionally, 32 new boilers at nine heating plants serving 11 sites that were funded by Mayor de Blasio earlier this year are currently on track. The bids for these boilers are due back to NYCHA by November 5th. We hope to begin construction on these he heating plants this spring. To be clear, these boilers are not off-the-shelf purchases, but traditionally take at least one year to scope and design before they are able to go out for bid. There is an additional four to six months included in, in for the procurement process before we can award a contract. Finally, construction takes two to three and a half years, depending on the size of the boiler plant. That means historically, boiler plants have taken three and a half to five years before they are fully renovated. This timeline has presented many issues, but the most serious is that we cannot deliver a new permanent heat source to our residents faster. In March, we announced an expedited timeline to streamline the process. We were able to cut one to two years out of the total timeline, depending on the size of the heating plant. We are keeping our promise. NYCHA scoped and designed the heating plants in six months, on schedule, and boilers are coming faster than ever before. As part of our five-year capital plan, we are investing a total of $808 million in heat-related programs with federal, state, and city funding, as well as investments from our energy performance contracts. HUD's EPC program 
enables us to replace boilers and modernize heating systems with assistance from energy service companies without spending capital dollars up front. The improvements in this program are funded by cost savings from reduced energy consumption. It must be reiterated, however, that despite our best efforts, a fundamental fact remains. NYCHA needs more funding to replace outdated infrastructure and to maintain our buildings in a state of good repair. Our portfolio requires billions for heating plants and re related infrastructure alone. This includes 1,100 boilers that need to be replaced. These boilers at this stage of their life cycle are unreliable and will not deliver the level of service that our residents deserve. We appreciate that the mayor has identified heating as a critical need and provided additional funding to help us make these repairs. The state for the past two budgets has included funds dedicated specifically to boiler replacement, but these funds have not yet been released. And the residents living at developments in the state pipeline continue to depend on aging, unreliable boilers. But we're not letting these financial hurdles limit us. While there is no silver bullet that will ensure that there will never be an outage at NYCHA, we are doing everything we can, making substantive changes to provide residents with the services that they deserve. We look forward to our continued work with the City Council and other partners to get the resources NYCHA needs to best serve our residents. And we will continue to use all of our resources wisely to maximize the benefit for the residents. Thank you again, and we are happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Vito. So we've heard from the residents about just this past weekend, as well as over the past two weeks, or just since October 1st, about the number of heat and hot water outages they've experienced. So just jumping right into the questions so we can figure out what is happening. As of today, your online tracker states that the following public housing developments do not have heat and hot water. Yep. 20 developments, 181 buildings, 13,585 units, 3,966 individuals. And we saw last night it was Astoria Houses, Baruch, Bushwick 2, Claremont, Coney Island, Douglas II, Gowanus, Grant, Lincoln, Marcy, Monroe, Pelham, Pink, Queensbridge. This is just what we were able to pull over the past 24 hours. So can you explain to us, and what's not on the list, I just want to make note, is Jefferson Houses. And can you give us the number of current developments that is without heat and hot water right now? Can you list a development name? Can you list a number of units? And can you list a number of people that are affected by that outage as of right now? Sure, so I'm going to start. So some of the developments that you um, mentioned um, were scheduled um, to, for us to um, make needed repairs meaning that we intentionally brought the system down okay, um, so there wasn't um, a defect with the, with the system. Um, Kathy and Javier can best um, uh, address the specifics, uh, but this is the time of year when heating plants are starting to, um, to really kind of fire up. Right? Um, they're, they're not at their optimal use during the summertime, right? and with temperatures that have been teetering um, in the 50s, uh, dropping down into the 40s, um, this is the time where we're making those necessary and needed repairs um, before we're actually into um, the throes of, of the winter. Uh, but again, I will um, ask Kathy and Javier uh, to elaborate more on the outages that you've mentioned. Uh, good, good afternoon, uh, council member. Um, so of the current outages, we are and these change um, within every 15 minutes. 
We have currently seven developments that are um, either without um, hot water or heat, four of which were scheduled outages. Um, as the GM referred, we had them scheduled uh, because the temperatures were going to be more mild today and it was an optimal time for us to make some repairs. So when that occurs, of course, we notify our residents ahead of time for scheduled outages so that they have been advised. Um, that affects, those seven developments affect uh, 52 buildings and 4,952 units and 11,629 individuals. So I have a question about the system itself. The tracking database that you use, when you go on the, the NYCHA website, and I'm just gonna show you this. This is what we see. And the numbers that you're reading, is it from this? Yes. So what you just read, if we log on to the website now and go to the database, we will see the same exact numbers that you just reported. Yes, it, depending what time you're running the report. Because I said it changes mm -hmm. as we close or open, so you'll see the numbers fluctuate throughout the day or okay. even you know, in a given hour. So when you go on the site, you can click on the current outages. Correct. And then there's a tab where you can click on restored within the last 24 hours. Yes. So when we did that, when I click on the current outages, you know, just from what you're saying, it could be different every 15 minutes, but what should be reflected in the restored within the last 24 hours should be what we saw if we clicked on previously the current tab. Am I right or wrong? Yes, so you would see if there was an outage on the current service interruption report that over the period of time, it would show up on the last 24 hours. But remember the, the 24 hour restoration report, that's also being adjusted as every 24 hour increment, then there's, there's developments that would drop off of that. So it, it only retains within the last day's restorations. So a restoration could have, could have occurred on Monday, you won't see it on this report, or if it occurred on Tuesday. On Tuesday, you likely, depending what time it was restored, you would still see it on the report. So there should be, it should correspond. It should correspond. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, so if I, if I went to the tab that said current yesterday and it was restored today, then that list should be on what was restored within the past 24 hours, whether it was, I mean, I get what you're saying over the, like, if it's at 6 a.m. and then I go back at 6 a.m. the next day and it's actually 7 a.m., 24 hours has passed, and so it would not be on that list. But we have developments that never made it to the list, so I'm just trying to figure out. Never made it to the outage list? Never made it to the outage list, period. Okay, so that could be, so an outage is when we have declared, so we have gone to the plant and the plant is offline and, and the outage is declared in our systems, either for a building or a particular line. I remember the, this from last Or the hearing. entire development. The building, right. the line, exactly. the, the room, right. I remember now that. Now someone, uh, individual residents can call in for their apartment, but that doesn't become an outage until there's an, uh, a larger number. That's what's triggered. Okay, so let me use this as an example. Okay. Okay. We had Glenmore houses, right? Now we took now I'm looking at this sheet and is heat is hot water is heat and hot water and then there's no there's water there's elevators there's gas so one development like no water at all right so let's just use with that rationale let's use Glenmore houses Glenmore houses was not at all listed as an outage but they had no water at all for two days over the weekend. So can you explain to me how that outage did not make it to the database? I, I don't know any specifics about that particular outage. I'd have to, to find out about it. I mean, they had pumps out there. They had, they had to go downstairs and get water from a bucket. So this was a major 
outage. Okay, we will look into that specific. No, the, no, no, the, no, the, no, 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 no. If I, if I, that was a major outage. We don't they have had no water. While we sit here, we will research that and have an answer for you. Okay. So what it seems to me, so what I'm trying but, to but, figure out. But this, the, the report you're referring to is hot water and heat. Well, right, we, we will, we'll, we'll we will have out. an answer for you before the end of the It hearing. says, it, the tab says heat, hot water, and water. Oh, you do, okay. So you're talking about. So the are you not tracking no water at all? So, you, so you're not tracking that on this database? I didn't, it, I don't see, it, it is not tracked on the heat and hot water one. It's tracked separately. So if we're talking about families not having sufficient heat or hot water, I would think that not having water at all is a should, is something that should be tracked as well, right? Uh, again, we'll if get you an can just allow it okay. to, to all right. So from the developments that we did list without heat and hot water that are on this tracking system, that are on the database. Can you explain to us, if we just go line by line so that we can understand what's happening, can you explain when will those services be restored so we can understand what's happening at the development and what type of problem it is and what needs to be done? Sure, so thank you for that question. And again, we are committed to rapid response on repairs. And I would restate, as the GM presented in his testimony, that we have 1,100 mm -hmm. boilers that are outdated and require replacement. So that is why we have set up communications and tracking tools so that all of our residents and customers know what the statuses are. So I'm going to ask Javier Almodovar, our heating director, to speak to some of the specific outages. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So. Astoria Houses is the first one on your list. Okay. Mm -hmm. Astoria Houses, um, although it says that it's not planned, is actually a planned outage related to construction. Baruch Houses is also a planned outage which is related to a steam line repair, a steam line that we're repa repairing right now. Uh, Bushwick Group's A and Wait, go back to Baruch Houses. What did you say? I said it's a steam line, a main underground steam line that we're in the process of uh, repairing. It's, it involves excavation. Uh, the steam line that's underground supplies the building with the steam that's generated from the boiler. But, but Javier, I'm sorry, that was a scheduled outage. That's a scheduled okay. outage, yes. So how long will they be without well, heat and hot water? Because it's a scheduled outage, we plan to have that back up before the end of the day. Okay. Next. Astoria as well, before the end of the day. Any of the planned outages, we, we, we plan them so that we can have them up within the eight hours that we're there. And you said Astoria was a planned outage? Yes. And on the site it says it was not a planned outage. Is there a reason why it says it's not a planned? It, it could have been entered into the system incorrectly by whoever put it in. So, okay. So who enters the information to the system? Because I just, you said it could have been entered incorrectly into the system. Mm -hmm. so, so who enters the information into the system? It would be either my heating staff or the property maintenance supervisor at the development. Normally when it's related to a, a scheduled construction work like it is at Astoria, uh, Bushwick as well, by the way, it's done by the property maintenance supervisor, the supervisors that are at the development. Okay, continue. And Lincoln is unscheduled. It's an issue with a, with a building uh, and it's no hot water. Lincoln Houses has hot water generating equipment that has been in place since the buildings were built. Uh, Monroe was an issue with- Going back to Lincoln, it says that Lincoln was without heat and hot water for, from the time we printed this, it said 37 hours. So that means it is more than 37 hours now, right? Yeah. And this, this is, I gotta make sure I'm looking at the right report uh, within the last 24 hours. So 
Lincoln Houses was a hot water issue related to the hot water generator, was, which was uh, a coil leak on the uh, hot water generator's um, neck piece. And that one was actually restored the same day, uh, late in the evening, because th these jobs are very complex jobs. Uh, it's a large piece of equipment that has to be taken apart uh, and then put back together, and it takes uh, a number of plumbers to do this work. So Lincoln is not a heat and hot water, it is just a... This one that Lincoln was a hot water issue. Not heat. Not heat. This one is hot water at Lincoln. So when you look at the site and you look at Lincoln, it says heat and hot water. So was that information entered incorrectly? This one is from the 21st on this sheet. October 21st. Yeah. Lincoln, not a planned outage, 37 hours. Report came in at 11.22 p.m. Are we looking at the same thing? That's what I'm looking at, yes. And the symbol that's next to Lincoln is a symbol for heat and hot water. There's one for heat, there's one for hot water, there's one for heat and hot water, and there's one for water. So was that information entered incorrectly? Is it a heating issue? Is it a hot water issue? Is it a heat and hot water issue? Is, have they been without heat and hot water for 37 hours? Plus? Right. I'm trying water. to figure this out. No. Council Member, just give us a minute to, to go over those notes <clears throat> because we do have um, conflicting information on this. So, point. and that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> The problem is this is, a, this is a new tracking system that we're using that's supposed to be transparent so people can know what's happening, so residents can know what's happening, so we can know what's happening. And what I'm hearing is, you know, we're not sure what's going on. It could have been entered incorrectly. It's noted, it's noted. Right? and yeah. we will take a closer look into this. It's difficult for me to go on right now because this is critical. Like, this is the first set of questions. We're asking how many developments are without heat and hot water. We're looking at the actual website that we're told to go to because we're not getting information from NYCHA. So if we're using this opportunity to have an oversight hearing and we're asking questions, I'm confused as to why we don't have the answers. Again, it's duly noted, right? and we will get back to you. I'm supposed to go, um, so we're going to sit here and wait until we can figure this out. Let's give you two, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. Just to make sure it's not me, colleagues. Do y'all have something <laughs> that's related to this? I'm sorry. That's related to this? What are you asking? Because I want to make sure that I'm not like off bases here. So first and foremost. Okay. I got it, yeah. So back to, I want to go back to Lincoln for a minute. So I, I. I was going solely by memory, and I looked Say, at wait, this. He, I was going solely by memory, and I looked at this incorrectly. And you're right; it is. It was heat and hot water, and the, the it was due to a uh, n too much heat condition that had to be corrected. That was caused by a steam leak in the tank room. And Say it one more time. It, you need to. It was caused by a too much heat complaint. Okay. That was caused by a steam leak in the tank room, and the steam to the building had to be shut off so that we can make the repair, okay. and it affected heat and hot water. Okay. 
So, so I, I, I want to apologize for, for being incorrect from the very beginning. So do they currently have heat and hot water? Yes. They do? Yes. This is from the 21st. When was that restored? This was restored the same day, the same evening. And what's today? 24th. Today's 24. the 24th. So when we spent about five minutes so, going over the current outages versus restored outages within 24 hours and how those are removed from the database after 24 hours, this is from the 21st, so. So it was reported on the 21st in the evening of the 21st. So it was restored the following day. On Which the was same the 22nd. Day within, so yes. that was 48 it went, hours. It went, it went into the evening the following day. So technically, that shouldn't be on this list, right? Because that was restored within 24 hours. But they're still on a list because of what? Based on what Ms. Pennington said a few minutes ago. This is a list of outages that were restored within the past 24 hours. No, it was the 24th. We're on the 24th. We're going to give y'all a few minutes to get it together before we can move on. I'm just trying to really get some clarity on this database because we're trying to figure out if we can actually look to this database and see what's happening and then the purpose of this to go through line by line of the different developments is to figure out what's happening at each development so we can really have an understanding of what needs to be done or what NYCHA is doing or how we can help. That's the purpose of this. And it would be helpful to be able to have this information readily available because this is information that you supposedly received and entered into the database. So it would be helpful to know what you're entering and who's entering it and be able to report on it. So as we said, these dashboards are created by staff for outages. They do not represent every complaint that comes in from a resident because these outages are reflecting where there's a major development outage either in a building or the entire development depends on the outage so in a, in a boiler plant we could have six boilers there could be two boilers down so the outage will reflect what part and how many units in that development are affected so these are created by our heating administrative staff and um, reflect current information and then as we close them then they are removed from the current outage report we don't I think we'd like to should we, excuse me one minute should we just pull up the, the thing that I've been looking at um, yeah, it's just too much Okay. So we'll, we, we will, we're going to look up the status on Lincoln. That's the one that's being questioned. It's still showing I mean, up on the at report. At this point, the system is being questioned. Not, I mean, Lincoln, yes. And, but in addition to that, the actual database itself. So let me ask a question about um, Sterling Rehab. Over the weekend, Sterling Rehab was without heat and hot water as it reported in the system for 57 hours. Can you explain why it took 57 plus hours in order to fix whatever the problem was at Sterling Rehab? So, um, so you can explain what happened? Can, yeah, we can certainly explain that. One piece of good news related to that outage is 
we are fortunate to be at that time of year where the temperatures are fluctuating. So residents at that development were in uh, time periods when the weather was warmer. Once we established the outage for repairs, we didn't go in and close it when the temperature, you know, caused, it w went up is my point. But um, there were extensive amount of repairs being done at that property. And then unfortunately, National Grid um, was working in the street on doing other work unrelated to NYCHA and there was a gas service that was disconnected to our property and that was after we had made the repairs. So it was kind of a sequence of problems that occurred at that property and I can ask um, sure. Javier to respond. Is that better? So at Sterling, um, the problem actually started on, on Friday. Friday there was a basement stoppage that affected the uh, equipment in the boiler room. Um, it's important to point out that the plant at Sterling is a fairly new plant. It's a digital plant, so it has digital electrical components that help it operate or they keep it running. The sewage stoppage affected a digital board on the master controller of the plant. Um, and when we attempted to purchase it locally, we could not locate it locally. So because we couldn't locate it locally, what we did was we went to plan B where we supplied heat from a neighboring building, uh, from the plant in the neighboring building, and we worked through Friday and Saturday to make that connection. Um, what's important to point out is that while we were doing this, the temperatures were in the 60s by this time. Thank God. That's exactly, thank God. Um, <clears throat> so Saturday when we were prepared to start up the, the plant that was going to support both buildings in preparation for Sunday, uh, there was an issue with gas service coming to the, the plant that was going to support both sides. At which, at which point we contacted the utility company. Uh, the utility company responded uh, that evening, on Saturday evening, and could not determine at that point what the cause was for the loss of gas service to the heating plant. Uh, we stood there with them till the end of their shift, and we returned the very next morning. And the very next morning, the utility company was on site again with us. Uh, they had trouble accessing a vault in the street and they quickly notified NYPD, which then dispatched a tow truck to remove the vehicle. And once they got into the vault, uh, by this time it was afternoon, they quickly determined what the cause was, and within two hours had the gas service restored to the building, which meant that by, um, I would say, 5 o'clock, the heat was restored to the residents on our end. At what point um, do high-level NYCHA officials become aware of heating outages? Is it like after six hours, 12 hours? So um, the reporting, and, and I have uh, now figured out what was going wrong when we were talking. So when we were looking at a report, that was the restoration report, not the current report, mm -hmm. okay? So Lincoln is not, Lincoln has services. Lincoln is not, not an outage at this time, but when we were looking at it, we clicked on the wrong tab. We clicked on the wrong tab in our database. So that is showing that Lincoln was restored and the outage was for 37 hours. And it, that it affected one building. Can you so, explain the um, restoration time? What does that mean? The, the amount of time it took to restore it or how long it's been restored? It, it's the amount of time that it took to restore it and confirm that it was restored from the moment that it was first reported. And in this case, it was first reported on the 21st, 21st at 11.22 p.m. So the amount of time it took to restore it plus the time that it was reported that it was restored. Is that what you just said? We confirm. We, so we restore and then we confirm. And we want to make sure that we confirm before we close the outage out. 
Okay, it would be helpful to actually have a tab that speaks to the amount of time that the service was actually out, mm -hmm. because it's easy to say that it was only out for three hours, but it took another 15 to actually confirm that it, the outage If, if, if go, anything, an this, outage. this outage reporting, if, if, I, if I may add, um, actually builds in where we're doing confirmation. So we go into the units and we do temperature testing, not in every unit, of course, on an outage because there would be too many units. But we take temperature readings and it's required to take a temperature reading to confirm that heat has been restored before we close the outage. If anything, um, this, these uh, numbers that you see include that confirmation time period. So where you see five hours outage, it may have been that they were without heat for four hours and our confirmation period took another hour. But I, I just want to, to make sure that, that um, we have answered your earlier question about the stability of this data. I can assure you that this is reflecting the current status of eight developments that do not have services at this time, of which four, five of them were scheduled outages for repairs, and that this is updated throughout the day and is accurate. I'm sorry for the earlier confusion, but we were on the wrong, we were technically challenged and we're on the wrong tab. We probably still have to review the transcript because it's still a little confusing. Now, you mentioned a gas outage with National Grid when we were talking about um, Sterling Rehab. So, there's another tab that speaks to gas outages. So does, does, can you explain to us when a gas outage actually um, has a direct impact on no heat and no hot water? When does that happen? What type of um, boilers or what type of heating systems? So uh, thanks for that question and it gives us an opportunity again to speak to the data. The gas outage tab you see on that report is cooking gas. So that it is not okay. related to heating. Okay, good to know. Okay, so <clears throat> every building has two gas service lines, one for the heating equipment and the other for the cooking gas. Uh, in this case, the gas to the building affected the heat and the hot water, because we have a hot water heater that's also um, supplied with gas. Okay. And I just want to recognize we have with us State Assemblywoman Latrice Walker in the audience, and I know she's on the Housing Committee in the New York State Assembly, so thank you for being here. And um, we share about 25 developments between my council district and her State Assembly district. Thank you for being here. I am going to, um, I have like a million questions, but I'm gonna um, stop right here and allow Council Member Ruben Diaz. And we've also been joined by Council Member Mark Traeger and Council Member Carlos Machaca and, and Council Member Salamanca. Thank you, Madam Chair, lady. Uh, I'm gonna read uh, Mr. Most Mustachiolo. I'm gonna read some of your Report. One, one of the paragraphs said, delivering services such as heat and hot water are at the heart of NYCHA's responsibility as a landlord. With new leadership at the helm, including interim chair Stanley Bresenov, we have undertaken significant steps to improve heat and hot water services for residents. Another paragraph said, we perform annual preventive maintenance on our heating equipment 
including making welding repair and repairs to boiler controls. We have overhauled 1,918 boilers citywide. In preparation for this heating section, could you, could you tell me of, of those boilers, those 1,980 boilers that you repair, could you, could you tell me how many in the Bronx? Uh, we can provide you with a breakdown um, by borough, so we can send it to the chair. So we can send you a complete list of all of the, I hate, the heating plants. I hate to believe that you are not prepared for this meeting. Because well, I'm so, sorry, all, sir. All but the we, questions we, we, we uh, most of the questions that we, that we ask, you keep saying we we I get back to you. Or we okay. Let me ask you another question. Do you know? Do you know they, these people are supposed to work for you? Do you know? Wallace Dupre. I'm sorry, sir. I don't know that individual. Do you know Gary Watts? No, sir. Do you know Denise Jill? Jill? Okay, I'll tell you what I'm. These are two emails sent by the director of Castle Hill Sino Center to them. One of them was, was sent on October 16 by Miss Emily Pelayo, who happens to be the director of Castle Hill Sino Center. Castle Hill is located 625 Castle Hill in the Bronx. Last year we had a problem, no heat, See for senior citizen, and we most of the year we we went they went to a to, to touch you. So the the October 16 email reads: Good morning. It is that time of the year again, and I hope this year can be better, better one for better one with heating. The, build, the heating in the building is cold. Not sure if you have to send someone to turn over the system for heat to, okay. And then the second one sent on October 22nd. The first one was, was the 16th. This is the 22nd. No one has gotten back to me on the heating on this building. Please, it is very cold. The seniors are complaining, and no one has come to, com to convert the HVAC system to heat. So this is you people not responding. And these are the pictures of seniors in a center with coats, with with a Russian hat for their head because there is no heat in that building. So I don't know when you say that you have established a new system and, 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 and doing better. I don't know where, I don't know how. So I will appreciate, number one, if you take a consideration to look on to Castle Hill Senior Center and onto Bronx River Senior Housing, the whole complex in Bronx River. I think that the job that you have been doing there, or all the people that are supposed to be doing, uh, uh, working there are making you look very bad. And I know you are a good guy, you're concerned, but the people there, the one in charge, are making you look very bad. Thank you. Um, so me and um, Council Member Ruben Diaz, we think alike clearly because we highlighted the same exact portions of your testimony. And so I just want to do a quick follow up. As the, um, Council Member Diaz stated in your testimony, it says we have overhauled 1,918 
boilers citywide, which is 98% of your boilers in preparation. And then it says, with the remaining 48 boilers are currently undergoing repairs. So I just wanted to know, what was a, a, just a quick, uh, what was the outcome of the overhaul that you actually did of all the boilers? And the reason why I ask is because we did have a, a, an opportunity to meet prior to this hearing. And when I asked a question about the overhauls, I was told that just because the overhaul was done does not mean that they are um, necessarily um, in decent conditions. And it was like a certain level of information that came out of the overhaul. So can you just give us a little sure. information about the overhaul? Now I'm just gonna start and then I'll hand over to Kathy. But the purpose of the overhaul, overhaul is really to identify problems in advance of heat season. It's not a perfect system. It does not identify every problem. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, during the summertime, it's difficult to determine what will go wrong when the heating plants are fully functional um, and providing heat and hot water um, optimally. Uh, but it's an attempt for us to, to get out in front of it. Okay. So, um, again, we continue to remain um, committed to rapid response. And as part of being able to rapidly respond during the summer, Months, we take, um, of course, the, the boiler plants are offline, and that's our opportunity to do what I call in layperson's term, a tune-up. So um, our director can describe in more detail what occurs. But the first phase is what's referred to as a summer overhaul. And then there is, during that process, the identification of repairs that happen in a, in a second phase. So it's not simultaneous. One occurs first, then the second. And as the repairs are identified, then we organize, deploy our staff around specific repairs identified during that process. And I'll ask uh, Mr. Almodovar to speak to the specificity of what we do in the summer. So the annual overhaul process um, is a process in where it is actually designed to preserve and restore the equipment's reliability by cleaning, cleaning it, lubricating it, adjusting it, uh, replacing worn components, and making repairs on each individual piece of equipment. Uh, what we did differently this year, particularly in particular with the uh, boiler plants, is we started earlier. By starting earlier, it allowed us to dig into some of the key uh, deficiencies within the plants. And some of the things that we, that we dug into were the uh, feed water leveling devices and the associated uh, equipment and piping with it. And the reason why we focus on this was because some of the issues that we experienced last year were related to water leveling problems. In the in the end of, in some of our plants, and so what we, we what we then did was <clears throat> we didn't only make repairs on the individual boilers. We also repiped the feed water lines on the boilers. We in some boiler plants we repipe the entire feed water system from the pump straight to each individual boiler. Um, in addition to that, we looked at the feed water pumps and instead of just lubricating them and repairing them, in some plants we replaced them as well. Um, these, are, these are some of the things that we did in the plant. And again, by, by starting earlier, we were able to identify some of these key components. So question, looking at the ones that you were able to identify with some issues, were those, um, reflected, you think, in the calls that were received with the outages? What we did was we looked at what happened last year, and we looked at the plants that we had problems with. Uh, for example, like LaGuardia. LaGuardia was one of the ones that we repiped the entire feed water system. Um, we looked at the unique problems that we had with them, and we tried to address those issues in those plants. Okay, you know what would be helpful to just look at um, the ones that you have identified as having problems and um, compare those with the calls that came in from um, the residents. That would be helpful. Okay, thank you. Council Member Torres. And um, one second. Um, we also have with us Assemblywoman um, Linda Rosenthal in the audience. Thank you so much for being here. 
I actually want to follow up on the chair's questions regarding summer overhaul. You said you began earlier. How much earlier did you begin? What's the period of time when you're overhauling boilers? We started in April. In April? And when do you normally start? Normally start in June. June, okay. And is, was every boiler overhauled during the summer? Or Say during again? that? Was every boiler overhauled during that period of time, before the heating season? We completed the overhaul of boilers at 98%, and we still have a few that are currently where we're working through the repair issues related to overhaul. And how, how, how many staff, how many boilers do you have to overhaul? How many what? How many boilers do you have to overhaul? How many? I have 1,969. And how much staff is dedicated to overhauling 1,900 boilers? That's all of my frontline staff and supervisors. What's that number? Do you have a number? Approximately 425 people. 425 people. Do you have staff that is dedicated to auditing the summer overhauls, verifying that it was done correctly? We have a quality assurance process where we have um, a, a special teams unit that does that. And how large is that team? That team currently is four people, but what we did differently. So four people are verifying the summer that's, overhauls of 1,900 boilers? That's the way it was last year. This year, we increased that to incorporate the area administrators as well. Okay, so what's that number? It went up to eight. Eight. Do you think eight is sufficient to verify the overhaul of 1,900 boilers? It has been working. How many, how many boilers have eight, those eight staffers audited or checked? Excuse me? How many boilers have those eight staffers in your quality assurance division have checked? We've done the quality assurance on all of them. On eight people did With quality eight. assurance on 1,900 boilers? Once the overhaul process is completed, they come and they perform the quality assurance. And 1,000, over what period of time? I'm sorry? Over what period of time? Over the entire course of the, of the overhaul um, season, which we started in April and ended in... Uh, October 1st, before October 1st. Councilor, no. if, I, if I may, sure. I want to add, because in, in my testimony I talked about um, efforts that we've made uh, mm -hmm. to, to um, digitize our information. And I believe that there was a criticism that you made um, of our process um, at the last hearing. Yes. Right? And it was well taken. Right? Um, so I would actually like... I did not realize that, but that it was well taken. That it's good well, it, it was. And so a lot of the information that formerly was captured manually um, is now captured um, in our database. Yeah. Right. So even though Javier is talking about actually having staff um, do a quality control yeah. check, uh, the information now um, is, is in, and I can have Bob Morano, um, who is the executive vice president for our IT division, talk about the changes that we made because they're, yeah. they're going I, to help us tremendously. And I appreciate those changes, but I'm limited for time, so I just want to... Okay go through my questions. Uh, are, are the staffers who perform the summer overhauls, are they required to produce reports? We have what's called a PM report that they fill out. And do those reports identify the repair needs of those boilers? The report identifies some of the repair needs, yes. And so I have a question, for, is NYCHA willing to make those reports available to the city council? Are you willing to even post them online so that residents can know here are the repair needs associated with a boiler in a particular development? And we'll have to look into um, how difficult or easy it might be to make them publicly available online. Okay. <clears throat> we can certainly provide you copies. Okay. What are the number of outages that have transpired so far in the heating season? I'm sorry, the number of, of outages. outages. Total number. So um, outages um, have been 70. And the average hours to complete those I'm sorry, the outages have been is 14.3, and that was at 22 developments. I'm sorry, the total number of outages has been 70? 70. 70. In the whole in, in heating 22, season? In 22 developments. Throughout the whole heating season? Oh, I'm sorry. I thought you, you were talking about just this no, heating season. No, not throughout this heating season. Yeah, this heat. So far, only 70 yes. outages. Yes. So it's for heat. Right. 70 for heat. How many for hot water? 161. So, so you seem um, pleased that there's only So these numbers, the Legal Aid Society earlier, I believe, testified 33,000 outages in the past few days. You're telling me 70 outages for heat and 
161 for hot water. I mean, for a portfolio of 175,000 units, those numbers seem suspiciously low. So. Well, the heating season just started October 1st, and the temperatures have been in our favor. Okay. So again, but it, there's the, the number I gave you was for heat, and then there's one for hot water, and these are the outages that we declare when the plant is down. Right, and sir, if I will add too, um, it would be helpful if Legal Aid can provide us with uh, the information that they use to come up with that number. That's from your website. But I just don't, like last Total year. Number. It's from your website. It reports 33,000? Yes. Mm -hmm. But it, it, that, and, and this is where I think, <clears throat> I wasn't here last winter. Right, but we'll so, but last, numbers. We, sir, if I can. When, 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 I can. when, when Chair Amprey Samuel and I conducted an investigation, we found there were 343,000 heat and hot water outages in the last heating season. Those, right? those were probably work orders. It's just a different way to, to measure. There's work orders and outages, and they're, they're just distinct types of data in our system. So, so what are the number of work orders? If, well, the number if, of work if I, I'm sorry, if I can. Sorry. I think one of the problems that we have had historically right, is that we are basically are, are double counting. That this includes duplicate outages. So, so th there is, these are not distinct number of residents that have been affected. Right. So if we had an outage that was restored and it was a repeat, um, we count that development twice. And so we need to do a better job as to how we publicly right, um, report out on how many residents were affected. Right. Because we're counting the same residents in the same development multiple times. And it's a different question. <laughs> I mean, what, what definition of outage would lead you to conclude that there were only 70 heating outages so far in the heating season? It's been, we're almost a month in. Uh, that number just is utterly implausible to me. So, so um, thank you for your question, and let me take I, this as an opportunity to clarify. So just for the basis of definition, an outage is a major service interruption affecting an entire development building, stair hall, or apartment line. A work order is a resident-initiated complaint about a deficiency that is called into our call centers about their individual unit. So it's just two different ways okay. that we're measuring it. One is unit-based. So if you, if you have a development with 1,000 units and the boilers break down there, you count that as one outage? If, if all the boilers were down, that would be counted as one outage, yes. So if there were multiple boilers that broke down at the same time affecting thousands of developments, you count that as one outage? Correct. So what are the number of work orders? One. So when a plant, when the entire plant is down, it affects both heat and hot water. And in that sense, we create an outage, one for heat and one for hot water. Now, within the plant, there are sectional valves. Um, and what does occur from time to time, and which drives up the number of outage, drives it up a yeah. bit, is that when a section of the location suffers a, let's say, a steam leak, we shut that section off to make the repairs on that steam leak, and it affects a number of buildings within a development. And in that sense, we don't create one single outage for the entire development. We then now create two outages for each building affected. Even though it's one outage, one for heat, one for hot water, because it's not the entire development, and just for the purposes of being as transparent as we can be, um, we'll make the outage work order for each building affected. I'm sure we can have an endless debate about the meaning of outages and work orders, but let's, I'll move on. So I understand that NYCHA has a massive capital need, but here's my criticism of the Housing Authority. Even if we gave you the funding that you need to upgrade your heating systems, I remain skeptical that you have the technical capacity to maintain those systems, right? You have boilers that date back to 1950, like the one in Staten Island that are performing well, that are well maintained, and then you have boilers that are substantially younger 
that are breaking down. And so that tells me it's not only about funding, it's also about management. It's about staffing, it's about training. Can I ask about training? Is the training of your heating staff different today than it was a year ago? Yes, it is. <laughs> what, what we did was w with all new um, HPTs that come in to the department, before now we had a 27-day uh, training course over the course of about six to nine months. We've expanded that to 38 days to include um, 11 days of more hands-on training. There's a uh, basic electrical, um, there's basic troubleshooting, uh, and a pump shop as well. To again, to include more hands-on training. And just very quickly, you say you have roving crews. What are the number of roving crews you have? During the heating season, right now we have 16 roving crews. 16 roving crews. What's the number of staffers in each roving crew? Two per crew. Two per crew. What are the number of developments overseen by each roving crew? They, in, they oversee the entire, the entire city. So all of our so developments. Wait, wait, you don't have a de developments assigned to each roving crew? They're broken down by cluster. So each roving so crew has about 12 to 15 developments. So how large is each cluster? Is it done by unit? Is it done, is there, are there five developments in each cluster? Or there, there, what's, what's the formula? About, there are about 12 to 15 developments in each cluster. They're set up so that geographically they're, they're close to one another. So a roving crew of two people mm -hmm. is responsible for responding to heat and hot water complaints in 12 to 15 developments? So if I, if I can, during my, in my testimony. I mean, I don't see how that's possible. I, I added in my testimony, I said that what we will be doing <clears throat> as the temperatures get colder is adding additional teams. Right, we've also supplemented our workforce with a third but, but, but party. But the temperatures are already cold, and the teams you have now are, in, are inadequate. If I can, please. Sure, finish. sure. Right, we've also supplemented our workforce um, with third party vendors, increasing the number of uh, developments, heating plants that are under third party um, from five um, to 46. Right, so we're taking some additional measures to supplement our workforce. Um, I, I would also like to add that although I agree that, that additional training um, is helpful, right, it, we're, what we're also talking about here too is that we're replacing our heating plants, right, the boilers. Right, what we have not yet addressed and there's- a, I'm sorry, what, do you, what, did you, what was your last we're, comment? We're, we're, we're replacing the heating plants, the boilers themselves. Right? And, and what we have. But, but my issue is even when you replace them, it's not I, clear to be you have the capacity to maintain them. But That's if I can my also issue. also finish, it, 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 in addition to capacity, right, um, what we're dealing with too is we're, we're installing new heating plants. Right? But the, the risers, the distribution systems, right, the underground distribution systems um, are not being upgraded. Right? And there's, a, you, there's an additional cost to doing that. Right? So the heating plant is working, but it's working extra hard. Right, because what we have not yet done is start to address the internal infrastructure within the buildings. Right, I, I, guess, I, I guess here's where we do, I think even if you had new, and I'll end here, even if you had new distribution systems, it's not clear to me that you have the staff that, it, that is sufficiently trained and sufficiently compensated enough to manage, you know, managing a boiler should be regarded as a skilled trade. And it's not clear to me that NYCHA treats it as a skilled trade. Well, you don't compensate your heating mechanics in the same manner that you compensate your plumbers or your elevator mechanics or your, your, your electricians. And so that's, that's my core issue with NYCHA, but I'll end it here. Thank you, and I, just, I, I think it's just important to just clear up the numbers um, just so we can be accurate and what we're saying, um, when, when I mentioned the um, 30,966, um, and, and then one other report talks about 32,000, uh, that's individuals based on the website that are affected by no heat or hot water, which is different from your number of reporting um, the actual outage, but in my lens, I'm constantly thinking about the people and the families that live in these units. And so I like to talk about the numbers of people. And so there were 32,000 people 
just over the past couple of weeks who were directly impacted, who had no heat and hot water. And I know during the last hearing, we talked about 320,000. And so just in the first two weeks, we're talking about 30,000. So I just wanna um, just make sure that we clarify and just, you know, like those are the numbers that we were talking about. And so I'm talking about people because that's what we're here for, the people. Absolutely, and that's um, why on our uh, commitment to share our data, we share that information at that site so that when that outage is declared, when that development is out, it's showing how many apartments, how many buildings, how many individuals, because um, we absolutely agree um, that um, restoring service rapidly is what we need to be focused on. And, and that is why we've taken so many of these steps, both on sharing the information and improving our communications with residents who can also help us by confirming that their heat has been restored and so forth. Okay, thank you. Councilmember Van Bramer. Followed thank by Councilmember Perkins. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. So um, I represent the Queensbridge houses and over the weekend heat went out for all of Queensbridge South, which uh, to the chair's point represents 1,600 units uh, with clearly at least 3,000 people affected. Um, it was not listed on the public system until Monday. Uh, people were not contacted within 24 hours by NYCHA. My office received numerous calls from cold constituents, including a, three, a mother with a three-week-old child who did not know what was happening because NYCHA did not communicate with the residents or my office. Um, we asked NYCHA how this could happen. We were told that there were communications breakdowns. It is entirely plausible because here at this hearing, I have witnessed numerous communication breakdowns from you all right in front of me. It has been shocking, the performance in this hearing. We are talking about heat and hot water for human beings, not about the shrubbery outside in the courtyard. This is basic human services, basic human decency, and you have not had the answers or you have been confused about your own answers in numerous places and numerous instances how can we have confidence that when it does get really cold, you're going to be able to get people the heat and hot water, and when it doesn't work, repair it in an appropriate amount of time and communicate with the residents who are affected if on this weekend where you talk about, well, the temperatures got up to 60 degrees, so it's no big deal, you weren't able to do so. Now, we know also that there's this third-party management system that's meant to be a solution to these problems. But we were informed by your office that over the weekend, that communication breakdown also occurred. Now this was touted as one of the success stories or one of the ways that we were actually gonna get a handle on this problem, but it didn't help the people of Queensbridge this weekend. Um, and furthermore, you, you've also uh, added Queensbridge South to the list on Monday, but then removed it on Tuesday. We've had at least several constituents come back to the office and say, no, 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 it isn't back. So I'm confused and I have zero confidence in your system because it was you yourself here today who when you were talking about the Astoria houses, which is a great community to the north of my district, uh, you said in your own paperwork right in front of you that the Astoria houses uh, says it's not planned on the paper there, but it is planned. But that's your information that you yourselves are responsible for. So you're here testifying at a city council hearing before the city council with a piece of paper in front of you that you even have to say is wrong even though you are responsible for entering the information. So where is our ability to be confident that you're able to do this, you're making the repairs, and quite frankly, to another council's, council member's point, there's the management uh, in place to make sure that all of these things aren't going to con continue to happen. Um, so I know that was a lot, um, but maybe you can attempt to address some of the things that happened this weekend, not just at Queensbridge South, but throughout, and 
why there's so much miscommunication, why there is so much confusion, uh, both in the system, online, and here at this hearing. So, so as indicated before, and I'm not making excuses, um, we did reference the, the wrong um, database, the wrong tab. Right? This is still a work in progress. Right? And, and we are trying to be as, um, as transparent um, and as precise in our reporting. Um, and we're, again, looking back at over years of, of how information like this has been reported. Right? And we are doing the best we can to improve on that. So talk to me about, this, this talk to me about Queens Bridge Houses uh, South this weekend, right? Heat goes out for 1,600 units, 1,600 units, the entire Queens Bridge South. It's not up on the system. Why not? I'm going to have to ask Javier to talk about the specifics of Queensbridge. So, so and, and um, I just want to comment, we, we do have uh, reports of uh, residents that were calling us. We had 320 calls from Queensbridge South. Um, we did address the outage uh, from the point that we received uh, calls within uh, th approximately 13 hours. Um, as the GM stated, these are uh, some of these are new systems. We have new relationships with our contractors. Um, all of this is just three weeks old. Um, certainly, there are areas that we need to improve on our internal communications, and we're absolutely committed to doing that. Um, we do make human errors, and um, that is unfortunate. But again, we can correct those as we're monitoring throughout the day all of our data and all of our outage information. And then I'll let uh, Mr. Almodovar speak to Queensbridge and what the issues were. <clears throat> so at Queensbridge, the plant did go down. Um, the third party vendor was contacted. He did come out. And there was a communication issue. And that's why it didn't make it to the website. The plant went down so again. So the communications issue, let's just stop there. Whose fault was it? The contractor did not communicate with our heat desk that is within our emergency services department that handles these uh, heat outages. And it's clear to them that that is part of their job, that they're supposed to do that? Yes, it, it is. And what happens when they don't do that and 1,600 apartments are left not knowing what's happening with their well, apartment? Well, if it continues to happen, then we have to then come to the conclusion that this is not working and we'll sever ties with that contractor. Okay, but we just concluded, based on your testimony, this is a brand new system, brand new mm -hmm. folks, rah, rah, we're three weeks in, and immediately they've dropped the ball right to begin with. So if I, the vendor is coming in this week to meet with us. Tell you, I'm sorry. The vendor, the contractor, is coming in to meet with us this week. Okay, so then I assume they will be notified, this happens again. There are a number of issues that we will be addressing with them. Okay, so you were saying about Queensbridge? Okay, so, and, and then it went down again on, on Monday. And on Monday, when the vendor responded, I sent some of my staff there as well to uh, see exactly what was going on because we were getting miscommunication. Uh, when we got there, the vendor was, uh, was in the plant, restoring the plant, and my staff was there making sure that they did. So you um, mentioned miscommunication on this Monday. What was the miscommunication between the, the contractor and NYCHA? Is that what you're saying? I was getting misleading information, rather. I'm Even sorry, worse, what was the misleading information? Well, I was getting information that was, conf it was kind of uh, conflicting between what the vendor was telling me, what property management was telling me, and what Ms. April was telling me as well. Because I was also in direct communication with Ms. Simpson, April Simpson, the TA president. I That's think. great, we love Ms. April, but then tell me person. what were the three different versions of the story? I, I, was, I was more focused on what Ms. April was saying as opposed to what the vendor was telling me and what property management was telling me. That sounds correct to me because I believe April Simpson as well, but what were the contractor telling you and, and were you able to verify whether or not it was true or not? Because let me just say this, mm -hmm. I love our 
TA presidents, and Miss April Simpson does an amazing job as the head of our Queensbridge I agree. TA. Absolutely. But you have a problem if you don't believe your own contractors who are responsible for fixing heat and hot water for your residents. So if I could just restate that these relationships with our, our new uh, contractors are three weeks old. We have some kinks in communications. NYCHA has a lot of protocols, particularly when it comes to after hours reporting. Even though we've met with our, our contractors, educated them, you know, and given them this information, I think where it fell short was them actually following through on how we had instructed them. We're addressing that. We've already worked through this particular issue with them on communications and are going to move forward with reinforcing what the expectations are. And so that's unfortunate, but um, I will say it's a three-week-old relationship and we're going to improve on it daily. It hasn't started well. So you were going to finish with the, the discrepancies and the... So again, I, I, I was more focused on what Ms. April was telling me and I was going by what she told me, which prompted me to send one of my field supervisors there to confirm that the contractor was on site. And he indeed was. And he was working on restoring the plant. By the time we got there, he already had two of the three boilers back in service. So um, let me just say this before I throw it back to the chair. Anybody watching this or hearing this would be disturbed and would have a severe lack of confidence in this three-week-old brand new system with a contractor that at least at Queensbridge South seems to have failed on multiple occasions, multiple occasions, right off the bat. And there seems to be a lack of confidence even in your own people in, in what the contractor's telling. Maybe even we're doubting whether or not they're on site. Well, they're on site, right? We're listening as we should to the TA uh, resident leader because Miss April knows what's going on in Queensbridge and is there to report to you, but we have a severe problem if you don't trust that your contractor is even on site and you've got to verify that um, with other people. This just isn't working, and again, I just want to say that this is people's lives. This is heat and hot water. If you don't have heat and hot water, you almost don't have an apartment. And, and this has got to be fixed because this is not cold weather. Right when you consider that we're getting to 30s and 20s, and we're going to have some really, really cold days with wind chill factors and single digits, and if this is what happens when we're in the 50s and the 40s, and people deserve heat and hot water all the time when they need it, but how can we trust you to be able to provide when it gets severely cold? I just don't have it, and I don't think this performance here has actually instilled a lot of confidence for me in this new system, the third party, otherwise, you're online, your notifications, um, all of it is severely lacking right now. Thank you, I actually have some follow-up to that particular round of questions. Um, who is the vendor at Queensbridge? George S. Hall. George S. Hall. And how many other contracts do they have as a third party vendor for other NYCHA developments? This is the first for them. So they only have? This one contract. This yeah. one contract. OK. Now, you mentioned. Um, but it's I important to, be, to point out. I'm, I'm, so, I'm sorry. It's important, you, it's important. How many developments? Or, are you saying how many developments or how many contracts? This is one contract with multiple developments with NYCHA. This is their first contract with NYCHA. You, how many developments? So they have 15 developments. Um, with that, that were under that contract. Can you repeat yourself? There are 15 no. developments that are covered under that contract. Okay. And Ms. Pennington, you mentioned um, just the actual protocol. So what are your after hour reporting protocols? So um, we have staff that work till midnight and then we have emergency services that supplement um, heating services uh, during the midnight to 8 a.m. period. And I will let um, Director Almodovar speak to the process of reporting in through those after hours. So we have a, a heat desk 
at the uh, emergency services uh, department at LIC and they track the uh, heating outages from 4 p.m. till midnight. Through the roving crews, they, they track the CHAZ alarms, um, and they look at work order trends, and they communicate with the vendors for the third-party sites after they've confirmed that there actually is an outage. And the third-party vendors also have uh, roving crews as well during the evening. Um, in addition to our roving teams, we've also incorporated some of the stationary engineers this year as well with our roving um, uh, crews as well. Did you have any problems at all um, with the system, the um, CCC system, over the weekend? Not that I'm aware of. Were there any, um, was it like a high volume of calls that might have caused some type of problem at all? So um, we do have some data. Uh, we just turned this system on live. And we um, had, a, since we turned it on, which is, I believe, since October 1st, we had 11,000 uh, restoration calls go out, of which uh, 4,198 residents um, confirmed that uh, services were restored. We also track abandon, so so some folks are abandoning the call. They're you know they're not finishing, or they're not they're not confirming, um, or they're not routing back to the call center. We did receive um, 877. Uh, requests to route back and reopen a work order. So, so far, this is just our first week or so of data on this new system. So we're seeing it, it's functioning, and we need to monitor then what is happening when the calls are being routed back to the call center. So is there a difference between um, how a work order gets generated between a development that um, NYCHA manages and operates and runs the um, boiler as opposed to um, a third party um, vendor managed development like Queensbridge? So they all, residents still, it's seamless to the residents, they still call the call center and all the creation of uh, work requests are done through that same process. So the resident calls and then it, the work order gets generated and then a NYCHA staffer go to the development, to the plant, and they either meet with a NYCHA worker or a NYCHA manager, like some, a NYCHA staff, or they would connect with a third party vendor. But the NYCHA staff is the one that actually goes to the development, either it's third party managed or not. And that um, confirmation that is entered into the system is the same because it's a NYCHA resident. Yes. I mean, the NYCHA staffer. You're talking about from the robocalls. So when, when there's, whenever there's an outage, resident gets a call, and then they get a, re we call it a I'm not talking about the robocall. Call. I'm not there yet. I'm oh, talking okay. about the generating of a work order or a ticket because of an outage. Yes. So the, the answer is yes. Yes. Uh, it's verified by a, a NYCHA staff person. I also would like to have um, Bob Morano. Um, answer the question that you asked about what happened over the weekend um, at CCC. Yes, I'm Bob Morano. Sorry. Bob Morano. And wait, before you start, the reason why I'm asking that, that question is because I'm trying to figure out the relationship and the, the like miscommunication or communication between the NYCHA staffer and the third party vendor to see if there's something there. So that's why I asked that question before it even flags to a robocall situation. Okay. And Mr. Marano, one second. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council members' questions? I do. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Bob Morano, NYCHA's Chief Information Officer. So we heard from the CCC on Sunday that there was an intermittent problem with the phone system that uh, out of the 200 or so calls they would get an hour, approximately 10 of them, um, we were able to hear one way. Uh, 
we can hear the residents, but the residents couldn't hear us. But the re when the residents called back, then they were able to get through. So there, were, there was a, a slight glitch with the phone systems at the CCC on Sunday. Thank you. Because that's what we heard all Sunday. Like there's a problem, there's a problem. We call, there's like some type of static, and then I made an attempt to call, and there was a problem, so thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Salamanca. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my questions are more directed uh, towards the temporary boilers. Um, the Melrose Houses has a, uh, has a temporary boiler. And I know Vito, we spoke, but I just want to get this on the record. Um, it's my understanding that their temporary boiler was not working. There was no heat or hot water at Melrose Houses from Thursday, October 18th through Sunday, October 21st. Um, that's four full days. And um, I, Vito, I called you when I, when, I, when I was informed that the temporary boiler at Melrose was not working. And you did respond back via text communication at 1038 that evening that the repairs uh, were made and that the heat was restored. Um, but in my conversation with you, um, you mentioned that Melrose Houses was not on your list of boilers that were not operating. Uh, so my question is, why, first, why was that not on the list? Why was, I guess, the leadership in NYCHA unaware that this temporary boiler, which has been placed there because the original boiler is not working, so now you have a temporary boiler that's not working either, um, what procedures are put in place to ensure that the temporary boilers are actually working? So we'll have Javier respond to exactly what happened at Melrose. So at Melrose, um, the boilers in the internal plant are operational. The mobile boiler is in place. It's not fully connected yet. That's why it wasn't operating. The idea is to have it connected so that it can support the internal plant should one of the old boilers inside the plant fail like it was doing last year. Um, I didn't get a report that Melrose was down. I did get some individual complaints related to specific apartments in specific buildings, which I did send people out to, and we did find some issues with the building's zone valves. Uh, there are one or two, I, and I don't know the exact number, but I can get you the exact number of zone valves at Melrose that are not operating on automatic. And in temperatures like we're having now where it fluctuates above the required um, point where, we're, where we are required to give heat, we have to send someone out manually to open a valve and then close it. And that's what the uh, issues at Melrose were related to. All right. Um, we have an annex of Melrose, uh, which is the Melrose uh, Mount Haven Senior Center. Uh, so you have a senior center on top of the senior center. You have, it's a senior building. Um, it's an annex of Melrose houses. Um, this senior center as well, um, you know, just last week on the 16th, I was informed that the seniors who go to the senior center to stay warm, well, the senior center boilers, not, the boiler's not working inside the senior center, and therefore you have seniors having lunch with their coats on and a leaky roof, which we know that that senior center, you know, NYCHA does a past job. So imagine this, you're cold at home, you go to a senior center to stay warm, it's just as cold, you know, as your home, you have your coat on, you're trying to have your lunch, it's raining outside, and there's a big hole on the ceiling tile because NYCHA has not fixed the, um, the leaks that are falling down in their, um, in their dining room. Um, do you have an update as to the, um, the heating in the Melrose Mahaven Senior Center? No, sir, I do not, but I All will right. gladly. If you can get me one, that would be uh, helpful. And then finally, Amorosania Airites. I know that we did a tour last year 
uh, with the president of Morrisini Air Rights. I have one building of, of, of their portfolio, 3204 Park Avenue. I know that they have a temporary boiler parked or sited, stationed outside in front of their development. Um, I, I see the emails between the president of Morrisini Air Rights and the property manager asking when is uh, asking uh, an update as to the temporary boiler, has it been maintenance or overhauled? And there's a lack of communication there. Um, it seems that they're not responding. Your, your, your property manager, whoever is responsible to respond back to the presidents at Morrisini Air Rights, there is, there's no response. Can you work on that in terms of ensuring that there's proper communication? And for the record, can you give me an update as to what's happening with that temporary boiler? How, how long will it be there? When will a permanent boiler be installed inside um, on Morrisani Air Rights? First, I'll, I'll say that I, I'll, I will gladly meet with Mr. Yelverton myself to give him an update on the when? mobile boiler. As soon as possible, as soon as possible. I'll, I'll give him a call and I'll make that arrangement myself. Um, as far as the mobile boiler, the mobile boiler that's on site is important to, to understand why it's there first. And if you don't mind, I would like to explain why it's there. The steam line that supplies steam to that building is deteriorated to the point that it needs to be replaced. The mobile boiler is there to support the heat and hot water needs for that one building. So the issue is with the steam line that supplies steam to that, to that line, to that building. That steam line, the construction on it has started. And the goal was to have a temporary steam line installed before the start of the heating season, but there were some delays related to permits, um, MTA, because the, the line runs directly above uh, a, a railroad. Um, and I'm happy to report that right now, it looks like we anticipate the temporary steam line being completed by the end of November, and at which point, um, we will then remove that mobile boiler. Um, and the building will be supplied from the main plant like it should be. So that's the update on the steam line. Now with the mobile boiler, it was overhauled about a week before the start of the heating season. Once it was overhauled, there was a slight smoking issue that uh, required a fuel regulator to be replaced and that was also replaced and it's been running since. All right. Um, I appreciate if you can please reach out to the president of Morrisini Air Rights. We'd like to get an update on the boiler issue at the Melrose Manhaven Senior Center. Um, and we'd like to schedule a walkthrough of some of my NYCHA developments now that the uh, cold weather is upon us to ensure that um, uh, just so you can inform me and we can walk with the presidents of these NYCHA developments so that we are all on the same page and they are aware of what's, what NYCHA is doing to address the issue. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Council Member Trey. Uh, thank you, Chair Amphrey Samuel, for holding this very important and very timely hearing and for your leadership and oversight uh, on this issue from day one. I truly appreciate that, and our residents truly appreciate that. Uh, I want to, you know, first say, uh, Hello to Vito, the GM. Uh, I, I will say that I find you to be incredibly responsive to me and to my office, even at 11 o'clock at night. Um, uh, and Mr. Ronnie Davis of Brooklyn Operations as well. Um, but just to be clear, being responsive to me does not mean the work gets done uh, right away as well. Uh, but I, I do acknowledge that you follow up with me and I r really appreciate that. Um, not every resident has access to veto. Not every resident has access to the highest levels of NYCHA. But we have to be their voice and we have to make sure that the work gets done. I'm gonna get kind of hyper-local to big picture issues here addressed at this hearing. Uh, Surfside Gardens in Coney Island, also one of the number of developments still operating on temporary boilers, now close to almost uh, so many years now since Superstorm Sandy, approaching now almost six years. Um, 2820 West 32nd Street, to be specific. 
a resident contacted NYCHA, had a ticket order issued that there was no heat. Someone came up, a technician, checked out the apartment, and the resident noted that afterwards the ticket order was closed, but there was still no heat being provided to the apartment. It turned out it was more than just her apartment, it was a number of apartments. Uh, at what point can a ticket order be closed? Shouldn't there be some verification that the work actually got done? So we have accurate numbers and figures to work with, so this does not happen again? Sure, so sir, uh, thank you. I'm going to have Kathy Pennington um, address the work order question, and followed by Deborah Goddard, who can give an update um, on the work that's happening at Surfside. Um, so, work order tickets, uh, if, if a um, heating plant technician comes into a, a unit, they're inspecting to see if there's a defect in a valve or a radiator, um, checking for any potential leaks. Um, and they would also be doing a temperature reading. So, the basis for closing would be they have to determine whether heat is on or not, and if it isn't, then the ticket would stay open until they would check other units and or be going back to the plant to check the plant. So the ticket wouldn't be closed unless it was what we call unfounded, meaning we took a temperature reading and it, it met the standard temperature that it should be at. I don't know in this particular case what occurred. We'd be more than glad to take a look at it. Well, well let's just see right now. Uh, is there a Surfside Gardens issue? We, we can look it up to see if there's one open. Is there a Surfside Gardens issue with regards to problems delivering heat to residents? Mm -hmm. So S Surfside. Surfside is a sandy affected location. There's a tremendous amount of work going on there not just in the boiler room, but in the distribution equipment as well. At Surfside, um, although there's some new equipment installed in the uh, tank room's distribution um, part of the building, there is still a lot more major work that's needed to support that uh, equipment. The equipment in the tank room that um, delivers the, the uh, heat to the building uh, works on an automatic setting, and it requires um, the information from a panel that's in the boiler room, which has not yet been uh, installed in the boiler room because of the ongoing work in the boiler room. So what happens is that although the equipment may be new, it's still not working automatically in some cases, and in other cases, the valves which control the heat delivery to the, to the building are not wired in yet because the wires, <clears throat> excuse me, the communication wires between the boiler room and the tank room are just not there yet. So there is a heating delivery issue remaining at Surfside? Yes. So Correct. During, so during, the during this time should have of never closed the ticket order because that's my, that's my concern here as well. Mm -hmm. The residents are telling us a problem we contact NYCHA to help resolve the problem. NYCHA then reports the ticket order has been closed and the resident says, Councilman, the problem is still ongoing. What are we doing to correct it? That's, that's a problem. Correct that until the board's decided. And it doesn't take $32 billion to fix this problem either. It's just a matter of getting our ducks in a row and getting the right information across. So what we're doing to ensure that we, we are supplying sufficient and adequate heat is that we have a separate roving team just to address the serve side area with these buildings that we require someone to manually open the valve so that when the temperature just drop um, and, and it's a little bit difficult to manage simply because the temperatures are fluctuating. We get complaints of no heat when the temperature drops below 55 and then we get complaints of too much heat when it goes above 55. And we have to constantly go back and forth and open and close this valve manually. So that's one of the ways that we're, we're addressing it right now. And once the temperature stays consistently below uh, 55, the need to close these valves would not um, be necessary. So, so if I could answer, well, that's not yes. the ideal 
um, circumstance right, until we can come up with a more permanent solution. Right, then we will continue to provide that service. Um, I, I do want to just go back to, for one second about the issuance of um, the issue that you raised about the work orders. Um, and again, this is a, a modification that we've made um, this heat season. And I, there are some numbers, and I, I know that um, Kathy Pennington mentioned them earlier. I, I think it's worth just repeating. Um, so, so far for this heat season, in, in response to a heat restoration, and as you well know, and as all of our residents know, um, in the past a robocall would be sent out and it would basically just tell you heat's been restored. Right? And there was no opportunity for the residents to, um, to provide us with information back. So far for this heat season, the new system has made um, 11,192 uh, calls that it pushed out to residents, right, informing them that heat was restored. Of those, 5,075 were actually responded to by our residents. Right? Um, 4,198 indicated to us that they agreed that service was restored. 877 then were then put back into the system where they would transfer to CCC so we can better uh, address the specific issues. Right? So the data that we have on the new system um, is at least showing at this point in time um, that we're getting a good response from our residents and we're able to pinpoint more specific um, concerns. Right, but in this particular case, uh, uh, General Manager, the resident contacted me again on top of being frustrated for her family not having heat or hot water to her apartment, to see that the technician or whoever closed the ticket order after the visit knowing there is no heat in her apartment, it's just wrong. And it further undermines credibility. And as we heard here today, there is a problem at this development. Now, when do you anticipate this problem being resolved? Because we are getting, as you've, we're getting closer and closer and deeper into the cold season. Good afternoon, Deborah Goddard. I just want to reiterate what Javier said. Um, the panels have to be, zone valves have to be opened manually as uh, once we are in a consistent heat season, they will be open, period. And there won't be the back and forth of needing to open and close them. So they'll be consistent. Okay, and, and I understand with temporary boilers, as I've gone through them since the beginning of my tenure in the city council, you can't regulate them, either too hot or too cold, and that's why we're waiting for the permanent boilers to, to be installed. Let me just quickly move on to a couple of other items. Con uh, worksite safety during the construction period. Uh, some months ago, I noted that at Coney Island houses, as they're doing work, there are mounds of dirt that are laying out. The wind is blowing. It's blowing into people's apartments. Uh, I've now noticed that issue at Gravesend houses. We must make sure that contractors or their subcontractors are complying with safety regulations because people are complaining about breathing problems, asthma, and there are people already with compromised immune systems and, and have uh, uh, breathing issues and conditions. They must cover, and there are rules about this, they must cover dust, they must cover dirt when they're doing work. So I, I will follow up with NYCHA about that, making sure they communicate to their contractors, particularly now at Gravesend Houses, that they comply with safety rules and regulations. And the last piece I'll say, and I thank the chair for, 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 the, for the time, I raised this issue a number of years ago, and I feel compelled to, to say this again in light of the comments from the administration. NYCHA residents, are tenants just like anywhere else, in my view. NYCHA is a landlord. When you fail to provide mandated services to your tenant, to the residents, they have a right, in my view, in the view of, of, of also legal uh, analysts, to a refund. There have been long periods of time of delay in pro not providing basic heat, hot water, basic services. I asked about a rent refund years ago. NYCHA was silent. Now I am hearing comments in the press, and there's a lawsuit now as well, that 
The administration is arguing that because NYCHA receives multiple sources of funding, it's complicated. Well, private landlords in the private industry also receive multiple sources of funding to operate and to maintain their housing. So I don't really see that as, as the difference. Is there anything in HUD regulations that prohibits NYCHA from providing a rent refund or a rent credit to a tenant that has been denied basic heat, hot water, basic service? Is there anything in HUD regulations that prohibits you? And can you, if there is, can you give that to the committee? Sir, so I will bring that question back to our law department and have them research that. I do not have the answer to that. I'm sorry, can you say that again? I said I don't have this the answer to that specific question, whether there is anything in HUD regulations that would prohibit um, any type of refund. I would have to bring that question back to our law department and have them conduct research. Well, GM, you're aware that there, there, was, a, there was a lawsuit that was filed over this exact very topic. I understand. Uh, but I, I heard the mayor's comments recently in the media that because NYCHA receives multiple sources of funding, it makes it complicated. There are private developers who receive multiple sources of funding to build housing. And they are still liable to provide basic services uh, to, to, to who, who lives in their buildings. I don't, I don't see the difference. Uh, and I have not found anything, I've not seen anything, that's why I'm, I asked, that prohibits you from doing that. But here's what I think Here's what I think will change, I hope will change. If NYCHA was now more on the hook to provide a rent refund to residents who have been denied basic services, maybe NYCHA would do a better job of getting its act together to make sure that delivery of services was actually happening. And as my colleague, uh, Councilmember Torres, mentioned, actually having skilled, licensed people do this work rather than contract out to consultants and subconsultants and sub-subconsultants. I, who I think have no capacity or no vested interest in seeing work happen. This is a moral issue beyond a legal issue, in my opinion. In the year 2018, New York City, $80 billion budget, or, I'm sorry, no, bigger than that, $89 billion, forgive me, yes, the budget grows, $89 billion. This, this should not be an issue of heat and hot water. So again, I thank the chair uh, for, for the time, and I'll follow up further on the Surfside Gardens and on the construction safety issues. Thank you. I'd just like to be clear, and I just want to read um, the mayor's exact statement. The mayor says, I just want to be straightforward. We can't do that. It's a chicken and egg problem. If we start taking away resources, it's only going to make the situation worse. These apartments are heavily subsidized. This is a way to ensure that hardworking New Yorkers have affordable housing. No one pays more than 30% of their income in rent. That's something we guarantee in public housing, but we cannot lose that revenue source. Our job is to make the situation better, and refunds don't make it better. They just don't. So just so that everybody can know what we were talking about, that was the mayor's statement. Councilmember Jonah. Thank you, Chair. Vito, of the 325 developments, the 2,400 uh, buildings, how many heating units do we have? I'm just going to ask that someone confirm my numbers, but I show 1,960 boilers. 66. 66? Yes. I'm sorry. 1,966. Thank you. And I, NYCHA falls under the same heating requirements as any private landlord? Heating season, temperatures? We do. Okay. 
So the heating season is now three weeks in. It began October 1st. That's correct. Inside temperature must be at a minimum of 68 degrees when the temperature outside is below 55. Between the hours of 6 a.m. and 10 p.m. Perfect. And from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m., the inside Irrespective temperature the outside must temperature, be at least 62. 62 degrees. And I thank the council for passing that legislation. Great. But those of you that are listening, please know that you're supposed to have heat today. It is 54 degrees. How many of the 1,966 boilers are operating today, giving sufficient heat to the roughly 400,000 residents? So the last, I can't run a, a refresh report, but the last report was that there were seven developments that um, didn't have service of the entire. When is that report? This was run before we came over around noon sometime. Se and how many units is that? Seven developments, how many boilers that, are we That for? is 3,507 units of the 175,000 this particular outage report. How many boilers are we referring to? Um, I don't have the number of boilers. Would you have that number? But we could get it for you. I mean, we have a certainly a count of how many boilers we have at each location that come up to this, this roughly 2,000 number. But I don't have offhand how many. Senator, my question is, of the 1,966 boilers, how many of them have been prepared for the winter season? Uh, and I'm going to hold you to this. How many have been prepared by the tune-ups that are needed, the tube cleaning, the chimney cleaning, the preparation that's needed for the boilers to either automatically go into winter mode or be put manually into mint winter mode so that we can get the heat that's needed to those apartments as of three weeks ago. So um, th thank you for that question. And we have completed um, overhaul on 98% of our boilers um, and 100% of our hot water systems. Uh, we've completed the overhaul, the remaining Overhaul, uh, please, because uh, I just want to make sure that we're sure. talking the same language. When you say overhaul, are you referring to the preparation that is needed for the boilers to be switched to winter mode? So I'm going to ask our heating director, Javier Altmanovar, to describe what we mean by overhaul. Thank you. So to answer your, your, your question, yes, we, we tune up the... Uh, uh, the boilers in the boiler plant. Um, as I said earlier today, we the, the overhaul process is designed to preserve and restore the existing equipment. Um, we do this by cleaning, lubricating, adjusting, uh, repairing warm parts, and making any repairs associated with the boiler itself. So of the 1,966 heating apparatuses, have they all been prepped and are ready to go as of three weeks ago? So I'm sorry, I just wanted to clarify on the, the total number. All right, so we actually have 2,097. Sorry, say 2,097 <coughs> boilers within our entire inventory. 131 of those are in developments. 131 are in developments under private management. So the 1,966 are boilers that are still under NYCHA management. So I just want to be clear about the okay. total numbers. And so what Javier is talking about has to do with the 1,966 boilers that are under NYCHA management, direct management. And the remaining... So they're all, all but 48 have had, have had the overhaul performed. And the 48, as I indicated in my testimony, we expect to have completed um, by the end of November. Okay. 
why haven't those 48, first let me make sure, is that the correct number? 40, all but 48 boilers of the 1,966 1, that are NYCHA's responsibilities have all been serviced and prepped for the winter. That's correct. Is that correct? That's correct. And the 48 that have not Gas line issue repairs. Say, speak up, I'm uh, sorry. So every boiler has a gas train on it, and what we find during the annual overhaul process is that some of these things require replacement because of possible leaks or the valve not functioning properly, so we can't get the uh, combustion on the boiler to be um, within the proper range. Um, and another issue that we're having with some of these boilers is welding. Is welding. Wel welding. Boiler welding. So if I can kind of put that, I think, into layman's terms, other repairs have to be made right, before we can perform the overhaul. I, I, okay, so I'm trying to understand this. There are 48 boilers that are not ready for winter. We're three weeks into the heating season. Didn't say that they're not ready for winter. You, the question was, did we perform summer overhaul? Summer overhaul is really designed to try to identify proactively any deficiencies. It doesn't mean that these heating plants are not functioning. Right. It means that we have not proactively performed an inspection to look to see what deficiencies we can correct. Right? But it does not mean that they're offline or that they're not working. So what does it actually mean? It means that... So, I own a home, right? and in the summertime, the company that services my boiler comes out in the summer, and they vacuum out the, uh, the chimney, they clean the boiler, they replace the, the filters. Right? That's what we have not done in these 48. Right? That doesn't mean that they're not working. It just means that we have not performed an overhaul to uh, try to identify proactively any deficiencies, any problems, um, but they're functioning. They're, you know. they're uh, okay. So, of the, going back to the, the, the question that we started with, the total number of boilers, the number that are down today. We are, have the number of developments. We don't have the number of boilers associated with that. That's what Kathy mentioned that we will get back to you on. Okay. Your question so, was how many boilers? We could tell you how many developments. And how many apartments. Okay. Maybe you'll get back to me on that as well. But of the 48 boilers, you just indicated that some of the problems are welding. That means, are they operational for winter mode to be able to give heat or not? It's a yes or a no question. So the plant itself where these boilers are have redundancy in place for this type of, um, these types of repairs. So while these repairs are being done, that particular boiler is not online, but the plant is fully functional. The repairs that I mentioned are related to the overhaul process. So while the overhaul, where we clean it, we tune it up, and we replace some of the components may have been completed, there are still some repair issues that were identified during the overhaul process that have not been finalized for those boilers. And that's not telling if they're operational or not, whether they're online or not. They're not online. So 40 the boiler, the boiler, the individual boiler is not online, but the plant is operational. Because we have multiple boilers. In a I don't know. I, this is a play, it, and I have an understanding of this mm -hmm. to some degree. Of the 1,966 boilers, the 48, are they operating or not? I still don't understand. Sir, so, there's a difference between a heating plant and a boiler. Okay. A heating yeah. plant could have four boilers, could have yes. six boilers. Right? What Javier is indicating is that if we have one boiler that is taken out of service because we have to do additional repairs, it does not mean that we have left the development, the heating plant, right, in a non-functioning mode. Right? The other five boilers are providing sufficient heat and hot water to the development. Right? Ideally, we want all six to be up and running. So I, you know the situation. You've been to our boiler rooms. Right? So you know what we're talking about, and there's a difference between a heating plant and a boiler. 
my so of the heating plants, and I refer to them as boilers as well. But okay, I understand no, that, what you're saying. I, I got it. Now. So of the heating plants, they're all operational, with the exception of the seven developments. Is that what I'm understanding? Correct. Yes. Okay. So yes. instead of using the word boiler, we'll use the word heating plant. Thank you. Okay. So of these seven, um, how? Is this consistent over a number of days that they've been down? Do we have problems that are not new from these seven heating plants? These plants are all reported with outages as of 1024, ex except for one that carried over from yesterday. But to date for this heat season, the duration of a heat outage it has been 14 hours. That's the average. I'm sorry? The average for duration of a heat outage for this heat season has been 14 hours. So some of them have been down longer than 14 hours. Others have been restored in less time. But the average time for an outage for this heat season to date is 14 hours. And as far as of the... Um Seven developments, would any of them be Throg's Neck or Pelham? Can you give me the seven developments that currently have no heat or the heating plants are not operational? So, so what I can share with you is as of we ran this report several hours ago, it may have changed, right, because mm -hmm. it changes every few minutes. So currently we have um, Baruch, Claremont Parkway, Grant, Howard Avenue, Lafayette, Patterson. I'm sorry, the last after Lafayette? Uh, Patterson. Roosevelt 1, Roosevelt 2, and Wagner. So the answer to your question, the answer to your question is no to the developments that you mentioned. To Throgs now. After Roosevelt 1, 2, what was the last one? Was Wagner. Wagner. Oh. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I got 9 now. That's Should 9. Be 10. Patterson at 3rd and yep. Patterson. So it's actually 10 developments. No, it's, it, it's 9 developments. At least this is what the report I'm looking at, nine developments. You might be looking at 15 minutes ago. As of, as of 344. And, and if, I, if I may just add, I think as we referred to before, some of these are planned. So for instance, Patterson is a planned outage okay. because we were actually tying in the new mobile boiler there uh, ahead of the heating plant replacement. So that will be uh, short term right. today. Yeah, four of them were scheduled. And going back to the 48 boilers that will, will probably be needed as the temperature falls below that, I would imagine the heating plants now are sufficient to give heat to those developments, although the 48 are not up and running. As the temperatures drop and the weather becomes more extreme, there's going to definitely be an impact because of those 48 boilers. What is the timeline that we see those repairs being made? And it sounds like it's various repairs from welding to gas uh, interruption. So the expectation is to have those on back online within the first week of November. Are any of the developments uh, out of gas? Any of these heating apparatuses um, gas-related problems where we have turnoffs? You mean to the entire plant? Yeah. No. Or to that blo boiler? Uh, it, some of the it may be units? to an individual boiler where the gas valve is not operating, but it's not necessarily that it's not getting gas. It's just the valve itself is not operating correctly. Just the valve. 
It's going to be a very long winter. Uh, I'm sure we're going to be talking about heating requirements uh, and basic necessities uh, of heat and hot water. I hope you're up to it. We've had a whole year, a whole season to prepare for this. And um, I just hope that we're ready to give our tenants the basic necessity of heat and hot water before we venture into the other issues. Thank you, Council Member Jonai. Just to follow up on um, the question about the 48 boilers, the, uh, out of any of the outages that we've seen over the past um, several days, were any of those outages related to um, or within one of the boiler plants where one of the 48 boilers are located? Wagner would be one of those sites. Wagner, um, two boilers suffered water damage. Two of the six suffered water damage. Wagner is, uh, is a, has an advanced boiler management system, and because of that, we had to hire a vendor to come in and make the repairs, and we're working with that vendor to do that. Okay, I appreciate it. That was real quick. As soon as I asked which one, you knew the which development it was located in. So can you provide us with a list of all of the developments where those boilers are? And I know that um, there was a, a request for a breakdown of all, the develop all of the boilers so that we can know within the council districts, like for each council member. The 48 we're referring to, correct? The 48. Chair? Right. Thank you. And since we're talking about boilers, how many mobile boilers does NYCHA have on hand for the heating emergencies? So we currently have uh, in our contingency plan one boiler on site and we are anticipating delivery of three additional boilers. Mobile boilers, excuse me. Which you just said? Three additional? Three additional. We already have one in, for, for contingency and we have three additional boilers, uh, mobile boilers that we anticipate delivery on um, this season. So how many, and this might have been stated, but how many developments currently are um, operating under a mobile boiler? So no, 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 no. How many mobile boilers are at developments currently in operation? Not how many developments, but how many mobile boilers are there at, like already dispersed at developments. I'm checking to see if we have that number with us. We'll double check the numbers, but we operations, we call heating operations, has 23 mobile boilers. And then at our Sandy sites, we have another 41. 23 mobile boilers, and that's Sandy, how many? Sandy, and Sandy sites, how many? is 41. Okay. So I'm not talking about Sandy. So 23 mobile boilers are currently operating a different development Correct. sites, or it could be the same. Today it's 23. 23. And then you have one boiler that is waiting to it's be. It's a backup. In the event there's a system there's that a goes down, installed. you can Correct. get that mobile boiler over there, and then you have three additional boilers out for delivery. Correct. So when will those boilers? We anticipate back? those deliveries this heating season. We're still waiting for confirmation on delivery. 
but they, the orders are placed and it just they have to be built, actually manufactured. How long does it usually take for delivery? Approximately eight to 12 weeks. Two to three months. October, November, December, January. Okay. How many mobile boilers does NYCHA have? Wait, how many mobile boilers does NYCHA actually own? Two. So the one that you have, and then one of the. So out of the 23, NYCHA owns two of them? Correct. We, le we lease them. Majority we lease, but we do have some that we own. Two. The order for the additional um, mobile units has already um, been put in. So it's not as if it's two months from today. Right? We've already started the, the purchasing process. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Does NYCHA's insurance company provide any reimbursement when the boilers fail? Um, I'll have to check with our insurance folks. I'm not sure about that. Because okay, the next the question answer. would be, if, if so, um, does that cover the opportunity to purchase or rent an actual boiler? Does the cost itself, like the, 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 fund, the money that you would receive from the insurance if one of the boilers actually break down, would that cover the cost for a mobile boiler? And we do you know how much? We will certainly look into it, but it would really be reimbursement, because obviously we would not wait for um, for the insurance company to to send us the check. Um, but we'll check. We're just thinking about the cash flow yes. because you know that's always an issue with no, no. this. And we will get back to you. Thank you. Okay. I'll hold off. Let me just go into it. Now going back to the tracking system, the database, is the My NYCHA app still functioning or operating as a tool to be able to see the outages from the public or the residents, the My NYCHA app? You can see ticket, Bob Morano, you can see tickets for your apartment. Um, I don't, th I'm not sure if it shows you the outage tickets themselves for, for, the, uh, for the development, I have to check on that. And what about the public facing side of the My NYCHA app? Because in the past, you were able to go to the, um, the NYCHA site and pull up the active and open outages. On the My NYCHA app itself? Yes. Um, we haven't changed anything, so if, it's, if it was there, it's still there. So it's still there, but it doesn't. I have to validate myself. I'm, I'm not sure. I'm so the, the, the site is still work. The site is yes. there and is up and running. Yes. But when you click on an individual development and you go to the tab that says outages, it says there are no outages um, to report it at this. It, there, are no, there are no open or active outages reported for each development. And so it seems to, it's a different system. And if the, it's easier to go to the NYCHA site and click on the de individual developments to look for a outage as it is to go to the new database to even find it. And so um, it's a bit of a discrepancy because when you go there, it says there are no outages reported. I will look into it and validate it. So will you do something? I mean, will, is, is there, is there a, a plan to not use that particular no, if, app? No, if it is not displaying it, then we will look into it and see if there is an issue with, with, with that site. It should be displaying the same outages as, as the other system. Okay. We'll have to validate that and get back to you. 
Okay. Well, I mean, you could take a look at it. Now. It's not working. It, okay. It's it's not. And that, that was one of the reasons why we asked this question is because it's not working and it, it's a bit confusing for residents and just the public. Okay. Councilmember Torres, round two. Thanks. A few more questions. I'm sorry. Uh, what are I know the number of boilers. How many heating plants? But 656. Okay, and I asked you earlier about, we had a back and forth about the number of outages. I'll ask the question differently. What are, what are the number of people who have been affected by heat and hot water outage in this heating season so far? Number of people affected, number of units affected. So number of units affected is approximately 4,000. 800 so far this heating season yes and the number of people I do not have that in front of me but let, I can look for it okay do we know the number of boilers that have broken down at least once out of the 1900 that are in your control well we know that uh, we had outages at 22 developments. This reporting doesn't get into the granular detail of how many boilers that is, but we could probably look at our dashboard okay. reports to determine how many boilers, but it affected 22 no. developments. And I have a question. I know you have roving crews, but my understanding ideally is that boilers are supposed to be staffed either most of the time or all the time. Are, are, are your boilers staffed most of the time or all the time? or your heating plants, rather? During the normal course of business, our heating plants are staffed. So during what hours? From 8 to 4.30. From 8 to 4.30. So from 4.30. Friday. So from 4.30 to 8, from 4.30 PM to 8 AM, your boilers or heating plants are unstaffed. We work with the roving to crews, rather, to address any issues that are out there. No, I understand the roving crews, but I'm asking, do you have staff stationed at your heating plants? You do not? No. So, for mo so most of the time, your, bo your heating plants, which contain multiple boilers, not just one, are unmanned, unstaffed. Okay. Can I ask, I'm, I'm, I have some questions about day-to-day -day boiler maintenance. Uh, what, what's the chemical treatment? What's the value of, a, of treating a boiler with chemicals? Chemical, chemical treatment helps preserve the metal of the boiler itself. <clears throat> Excuse me. It preserves, so the waters are corrosive, and without the chemical treatment, the water would corrode the metal, right? So if there's no chemical treatment or if it's done improperly, the water will corrode the actual infrastructure. How often is chemical treatment supposed to be undertaken? The expectation is that it's done uh, every day. We do testing and we treat as required. The expectation, do you verify whether it's done every day or? I have not verified that it's done every day, but the, the expectation is that my field supervisors are. W what happens when, if it's not done every day, what happens? Then the field supervisor is required to explain why and, and or uh, discipline the employee or perhaps train them if it's a training issue. Are you supposed to document whether you've chemically treated a boiler? There is a log in the boiler room that's, that's, uh, that tracks that. And you're supposed to chemically treat it once a day? Test. Test it. Test at least daily and treat as required. And is it done in-house or is it done by a contractor? I'm sorry? Is it done in-house or is it done by a contractor? It's done by our in-house staff right now. Do you have, con have you ever had a contractors conduct chemical treatments of your boilers? We have in the past, yes. And did those contractors do it properly? To the best of my knowledge, yes, they did. So you've ne you, you're not aware of a single instance in which a contractor did improper chemical treatment there were in issues, your boilers? There were issues with the contractor related to specific staff members that they employed. And when we brought those issues to the contractor, 
the contractor took action against those individuals and made corrections. Well, the contractor, so there was a case of improper chemical there, treatment. There was, a, for about a year, we, we did chemical treatment with a, with a vendor. Okay, and so, and that vendor did improper treatment? No, and I'm not saying that he did improper treatment. What I'm saying is that when there were issues related to a specific employee that may have been... What, what were the issues? The issues were that he was either not removing the water properly or he was not securing the shunt feeder properly, which is one of the issues that I remember. Um, when we brought those issues to the contractor, he removed that person. And over what period of time? We did this for about a year. Did this, this particular employee who was... No, no, the employee was removed immediately. Okay. Well, what's the name of the contractor? Um, Metro, Metro Group. I want to say it was Metro Group. And what about boiler readings? What's the value of boiler readings? I'm sorry? Boiler readings. Boiler readings, you said? Readings, yeah. Checking boiler, boiler readings. readings, yeah. So which reading are you referring to? Because there's a number of readings. I'm, I'm, I'm not an expert, so. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, so boiler readings, some of the readings that we take are stack temperature readings. We, stay, we take um, steam pressure readings as well. We take readings that are associated with our uh, safety tests. Um, we make sure that the safety devices are functioning when we perform what's called a blowdown on each operating boiler uh, to ensure that the low water cutoffs are operating properly and the amount of time that it takes for that device to cut off the boiler is recorded. Um, we also perform what's called a flame failure test and we record the number of seconds it takes for that boiler to shut off. And how often do you have to conduct those this, tests? This is done daily. Daily, the, the safety Monday test. Monday Friday. And the, and the readings as well. The stack readings, the steam readings, those are done daily or those? It's done daily. Is it once a day? It's done more than once a day, once in the morning and again in the afternoon. And again in the afternoon. And that's what's done more than once a day, which particular reading? I'm sorry? Which particular reading is done more than once a day? Uh, the safety reading that I, that I mentioned is done first thing in the morning, and then the stack readings are done throughout the day. And, the, the and, and all of this is recorded? On a boiler room daily log sheet, which we've uh, recently moved to, towards automating. So uh, it's, no, it's a paper-driven report right now, but um, through some of our enhancements, IT enhancements, yeah. we're automating it so it's on the handheld. What is, the, what, what is an air test? What's the value purpose of an air test? An air test on a... Boiler, we don't do an air test on a boiler, we do air tests um, on vacuum systems. Okay. And, how, and what's the value? What does the air test reveal? An air test, what it does, it, it proves tightness of the system, of the distribution piping. Does it check for leaks or? It, it, it tells you whether the system is tight. What does that mean? I don't it, understand. That, well, because it's a vacuum system, it's not going to have any air pressure on it. So if it's not tight, what does that practically mean? It means that, what does that mean for the tenants in the apartment? It means that there may be a vacuum leak in the system that may affect distribution. And it may create an imbalance in the system. So the air testing can tell you whether the heat heating is properly distributed? Potentially, yes. Yes. How, how often do you conduct air tests? Air testing, we haven't conducted air testing in quite some time. Okay. So what do you mean quite some time? I'm sorry? What do you mean quite some time? Well, I've, I've, I've been with the heating department for about almost three years now, and I, I don't recall the last time we performed an air so test. In the th so air, the purpose of air testing is to identify the proper distribution of heat, whether residents are receiving so a proper amount of heat. And you're telling me that in your three years in the heating division, mm -hmm. you cannot recall one instance in which the system has been air tested. We have not performed air testing. And why is that? Staffing levels. Okay. What about the traps? How often do you check the traps? The float and thermostatic traps? We do that every three years. We rebuild them every three years. How, how often are you supposed to check them? 
Like, what's the best practice? And the best practice is to check them throughout the um, throughout the year as we find issues with a. With so you're, suppo you're with supposed to check them at various points in the year. I'm but sorry. You, you're supposed to check the traps at various points in the year, but you you you. How often do you actually check them? We rebuilt them every three years. Every three years. Mm -hmm. Okay. And how do you how do you check them? What's your method for checking them? Do you open them? Do you use infrared, ultrasound? What's your method? We do an, uh, what's called a an infrared temperature on the supply and the return on it. And how reliable is infrared? I'm sorry. How reliable is infrared for checking a trap? Is it as reliable as opening the trap? It is as reliable as ultrasound. Well, we don't do ultrasound, but um, opening the trap is probably the best way to determine whether the mechanism is working, yeah. but doing the, the, um, the temperature testing, it tells us if there's a problem with that trap. It allows us to identify that there is. And is it reliable? It's reliable. And how often do you do the infrared? Is that the one you do every three years? I'm sorry? Is that the testing that you do every three years? Well, every, every three years, we, we, we look to open and rebuild it. Okay. And but then over the course of the year, you, you use infrared. So when, if and when there's an issue with, uh, with that riser or that apartment line, we'll do the, the testing of the trap. Okay. Uh, what is an orifice schedule? What's a what? An orifice schedule. If I'm mispronouncing it, I apologize. Mm -hmm. You're not. You're pronouncing it correctly. It, an orifice schedule is a schedule that's associated with the radiator traps in a two-pipe gravity system. And so what happens if, if the valves are not set according to an oracle schedule? It would also create an imbalance. It would create an imbalance. So are, are you, it would create an can, overheating or underheating. Can, can you assure me that every valve in your system is set according to the oracle schedule? As, to the best of my knowledge, they, they are. And when our heating staff replaces a valve, they mimic the existing orifice setting on that valve. They're trained to do this. And that's something that's recorded? I'm sorry? Is that recorded, whether it's been set according to when, the When a radiator valve is replaced, there may be a work order associated with it, but it's not recorded that they, they made the proper adjustment. The expectation is that they are making the proper adjustment because that's part of their training. And then I guess as far as you brought up earlier there was insufficient resources for air testing, and there's a need for boiler welding, right? That a number of those 40 boilers have yet to be fully overhauled because you need more resources for welding. Have you brought these concerns to City Hall and say, you know, we really need more resources for air testing our boilers and, and more welders so that we can overhaul them in preparation for the winter? Are, are those requests that you've made of City Hall and, and what were the responses to those requests. So I, I want to take that answer um, while Javier just looks at some of my questions. Um, we have had unlimited resources um, from City Hall, um, with, especially with respect to uh, for this upcoming heat season. Um, what Javier indicated is that a lack of resources. Um, we, we contract out if we don't have internal um, resources to address these issues. And we have used a variety of different tools. Um, so, so it's not as if um, we have not received. No, but clearly, I mean, the support. with respect, general manager, a lack of resources has led to a delay in the summer overhaul. Right? If you had a sufficient number of welders, you, you would have been able to overhaul those boilers. Right? But we have um, outside contractors that we have at our disposal. Then so I think if, that the if, issue if, is not. Is I guess if, if you have those contractors at your disposal, why is the job not done yet? Well, I think we need to find out exactly if, if that was the only issue um, that's unresolved, which is the welding. Right. And when the, was that brought to our attention? I mean, the impression I have is that that's the dominant issue, the welding. What's the question on welding? That boiler welding is a leading issue, or one of the leading issues in causing the delay in the summer overhaul. In some of our of older plants, welding is, is an issue. It is an issue, but we do get through it. We work with the vendor to create a schedule that, that uh, complements our overhaul schedule. So I can go on forever, but in the interest of time, I will. Okay, we just have a few more questions, and I'm gonna just breeze through them. I know we have some um, state electeds who were present today. 
There were a number of developments um, that were slated for new boilers, um, and that was with the state funding um, that we read at the beginning of the year. Any of the boilers that were designated for the state funding because of what's happening with the consent decree and um, the last I heard there was no release of state funding, can you just give us a sense of what's happening with those developments? Have you um, uh, looked at the planning around it and um, strategized to determine that those boilers will be, be replaced by city funding at all? Have you made any changes? So can you just speak to um, what's happening with the state funds? and um, the developments that were slated to receive new boilers or um, some type of heating upgrades under the state funding? Sure, um, I'll take that one. Um, we certainly wish we had the state funding. It's uh, almost $250 million worth of funding that's not been released. That is not something that we can immediately replace with funds that are otherwise programmed, including some federal funds for boilers. But we do look at the list. So for instance, we had a problem with International Tower. We've taken that off the state list. We've addressed it otherwise. And we will continue to have that kind of look. But I have to emphasize um, $250 million is a resource that's precious to us. And we simply can't create that money overnight out of other resources. What about Tilden Houses? Just a minute. Tilden is still slated um, for the state money investment. Can you provide us with a list of the developments that were slated for state money that is now um, where you can't wait for the state money and it's through the city? That Absolutely. Would be very helpful. Thank you. Um, I know we talked about the heating plant technicians and staffing. In light of what happened last year with the um, number of heating plant technicians, about a third who went on um, to different positions who were promoted, can you speak to um, where you are now with that number and if there's any anticipation of movement with those particular um, individuals? And also, we, I remember there was a new cohort of um, entry-level positions that were known as caretaker H, and it was a position, like some a training position, entry-level position, and it was, I think, a cohort of about 28 um, new hires. So can you talk to us a little bit about the caretaker H as well? So I'm going Thank to start you. with the um, HPTs. So we are, we are going into this heat season um, with a 20% a increase um, in the number of HPTs than we did last heat season. Um, so we have 300 um, HPTs on board as of today. Um, last year when we began heat season, that number was approximately 250. Right. In addition to, um, in my testimony, I had also mentioned that we are, uh, that we hired um, additional titles. Right. We're bringing on staff in, in non-traditional titles. I say non-traditional, not the HPT titles. So we're using, um, we're hiring additional um, oiler, um, oilers. We've hired additional plumbers and plumbers helpers. And for the first time, um, we're using stationary engineers to actually um, work with us in, um, in maintaining our heating plants. Right? The agency used stationary engineers after Sandy, um, but the use of the sta stationary engineer title at that time was to maintain the mobile units. Um, so we have brought 16 stationary engineers on for this heat season, uh, and their role is to work with us um, and ensuring that the repairs um, be made to our heating plants more timely. So the, the caretaker H title I'm not familiar with. So yeah, I can give some high level and then we can ask our um, one of our HR directors to speak to all the various initiatives that we implemented around staffing. Um, but we also, um, after last season, you know, we analyzed what's our skill set, what was our experience with some of the teams that came in to assist NYCHA during that terrible cold spell. And that's when we decided to bring in uh, some stationary engineers. We added, uh, um, we are hiring and added electricians, plumbers, and plumbers helpers to complement um, our staffing. And um, compared, to, as the GM mentioned, compared to last year, we have uh, 
more than 50 uh, additional HPTs uh, this year than last year. And I'll ask David Marcinek to speak to the various HR initiatives that also uh, involves uh, the uh, caretaker maintenance program. Right. And while we're waiting for Dave, um, Bob would just like to respond back to your question about the information on the website. Yeah, I want to con Sorry, I want to concur with you. I just checked the MyNYCHA development site. It's the site where you can go into an individual development and see information about the development, when it was built, and how many acres it is. And there's a section on there that has outages, and it's not being updated with, with the heating outages. And it'll be corrected by, uh, by COB Friday. Thank you. Uh, just while we have this little intermission, I also did want to correct a statistic I gave earlier. Um, they're actually, the number of unique units affected was 7,489. I looked at the wrong column because my print is too small and uh, said it was 4,000, but it was actually uh, 7,489. And these were units affected with heat outage. Okay, and Morano, the, the both sites will have the same exact information, correct? Yes, it'll pull from the, from the exact same place. Also, the MyNYCHA app has the information on it, so that's why I was a little hesitant in my response. So the MyNYCHA app does have outages, uh, current outages. If you go onto the app, you'll see what you'll see on the, uh, on the website. Thank you, and please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Okay, thank you. And your name? My name is David Marsnek. I am Senior Deputy Director of Human Resources at the Housing Authority. I'd like to speak specifically about three of the initiatives that we've embarked upon since last heating season. The first was actually uh, referenced by the GM and Ms. Pennington, and that is specifically in regard to position classification and the analysis of the tidal structure within heating and the range of skills in order to deliver the heating services and specifically the diversification of the tidal mix. So for example, the uh, stationary engineers, the oilers, the teams of plumbers. The second approach was- Can you pull the mic towards your mouth? Sure. Thank you. Second approach was improving our recruiting, both for civil service and also for provisional hiring. Specifically with respect to civil service, we partnered with DCAS uh, in order to uh, petition for continuous testing for the titles that, that are heating related. We were successful in getting a more frequent exam schedule for heating plant technician. So for example, the uh, heating plant technician exam both promotional and open competitive uh, was given in August of this year. DCAS supplied us also with the, the names of those test takers so that we can canvass those individuals for uh, possible provisional appointment pending the certification of the actual list and appointment on a, on a permanent basis. Um, as well, we uh, are currently working the um, maintenance worker civil service list if you recall last season, we had a number of heating plant technicians that promoted upwards to maintenance worker and assistant resident building superintendent. We were successful in this uh, uh, movement of the uh, current, most current civil service list for maintenance worker to appoint 23 heating plant technicians in place in our heating department. And moreover, for the next maintenance worker exam, um, we were successful in getting a selective certification option that will be delivered, um, the test will be administered in December of this year. The selective certification option will allow us to cull from the master list, the overall open competitive civil service list for maintenance worker for those that have a heating specialty. So we'll be able strategically to able to pinpoint those who are currently are heating plant technicians in service and those um, in the general public who have the heating skill mix to join us in our heating department. On the, 
on the provisional front for uh, the periods when we don't have an active civil service list, we've uh, improved our recruiting. So again, we've partnered with DCAS and their Office of Citywide uh, Recruiting Services. Uh, we held a job fair in April, for example. Uh, we've um, improved our outreach. Uh, through how many did you media. pull from the provisional list? Like how many people have you hired? How many people are like ready to be deployed who are like during this heating season now? I, I'm Surfside. not understanding the question. Because you were saying that you, which you've improved on. So I'm just like asking, like for body numbers, for the provisionals, did you ha did you hire like 20 more provisional people um, for this heating season to work in the heating plants? Is 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 can you like give me numbers at all? Uh, there are several dozen provisionals for um, HPT at this point. So we're hiring provisionals again. Um, again, until such time as we get a new civil service list. Um, it was given in August. It takes about nine months for it to uh, be certified, established and certified. So uh, we do anticipate that it would be ready for the next heating season, the next civil service list. Okay. Um, we've, um, we've even done, uh, uh, gone on to such uh, platforms as LinkedIn send out invitations to HVAC professionals um, and been able to make appointments for those. If you were working in the perfect world right now, how many people would you need employed at NYCHA right now to assist with um, all of the vacancy, whatever vacancy positions or whatever you could project as a problem um, from the skilled workers, the, the oilers or the electricians or the plumbers, how many people do you think you would, NYCHA will need to have employed right now to assist with this heating season based on the information and knowledge that you have about your buildings and your systems? Yeah, so I can't answer that okay. right now. What, what I, I do want to stress though, um, and as mentioned in my testimony, is that in addition to having 20% having more um, HPTs, um, there are a number of other, other titles um, that we are using um, specifically f to address heat problems. So it's not just um, the HPT title series. And what's important to note that, and also in my testimony, um, that in addition to the five developments that were under third party management, we've increased that up to 46. Right? So at the same time that we have 46 developments, that will be um, monitored by a private third party, we've increased the number of HPTs. So they're responsible for fewer developments, right, but we have 20% more. Right? So it's important that uh, I think what we're going into this heat season, staffing wise, um, we're comfortable with that. And obviously we have the, um, the ability um, and, and the support from the administration to increase that if we need to. So that's what we want to hear, the fact that in the event there's some type of an emergency, some type of outing, um, outage, and you know that you are not, that the particular development needs a new boiler, they don't have one, there's not an opportunity to put, or it doesn't make sense to put a mobile boiler there, but you do have somebody readily available that can be deployed to go there if it's an electrician, if it's a plumber, if it's an oiler, someone. So that's what we want to hear, like if there's yes. a, a, a cadre of um, folks that you can call at the last minute and get them um, so it, so on boarded right and so in addition to what the GM just mentioned you know and with our temp hires it, not only did we increase the numbers but we're really looking at what are the skills required to manage very very old plants right so we have given to our contractors the newer plants because they can bring in um, the best skill sets to those newer plants and our staff were bringing in more skill sets to our old plants that we continue to manage. Like the stationary engineers, we added more plumbers and plumber helpers. We also have a whole another department called um, Skilled Trades Division that we use plumbers and electricians in addition to the, to the over 500 in the heating department to supplement repair services um, now, for heating. Now, for this now. heating yes. system, yes. this heating season. Yes. Okay, and the Caretaker H? So the Caretaker H program is uh, not yet online. It, we are in the midst of finalizing the Memorandum of Understanding with uh, New York City College of Technology, and uh, that will uh, produce a uh, training program, uh, principally, um,
recruiting from the resident population who would be able to come on board as caretakers. What's the um, time frame? Um, the time frame, We don't believe that that will be in place for this heat season. Okay, but the reason why I mention that is because it, when we submitted the um, the letter asking like several questions related to the heating uh, plant technicians and what's happening, and I'm talking about the oversight and investigation um, letter, the joint letter between myself and um, Councilmember Torres, it took a very long time to get responses to that particular letter. And we received the responses, I wanna say um, last month, September 18th, and it specifically states that there would be, I wanna say 28 cohorts, um, and they would be um, hired or going through this process the fall of 2018, and they would be completed and ready um, early 2019. So that's why I asked about that. So just wanna, if you wanna clarify. Okay, so I just want to um, to address that. Mm -hmm. So the caretaker H, uh, so we expect that to begin um, in early 2019 with the program, and it will take approximately one year um, for the staff to be fully trained. Okay. And the last set of questions are related to um, what's happening with the design process and um, procurement phase in the construction for Ms. Goddard. Can you just explain to us um, the amount of time that you were able to cut off for this process? And I know that I wanna say maybe March or so, there was an announcement around the 20 months of, of um, time that you were able to save and the mayor has mentioned this several times so can you just explain to us where you are now in that process sure so the aspect that we can most control by ourselves of course was our design process and we um, proposed to cut that in half from 12 months to six months we did do that um, and those uh, projects are on the street now for bid we also have an agreement with... Uh, and just so we can be... Can, can you just give us an example? Can you give us, like, um, what does that mean? Um, in the, it's out in the street now for bids. So uh, can you relate it to maybe a particular development or a particular um, project that you're working on just so it could be real? Sure. So the uh, sites that are getting new boilers under the city... Uh, program are Farragut, Wrangell, Sotomayor, Cypress, Taft, Morris, which includes Morris 1, 2, and Morrisania, Fiorentino, Robinson, Long Island Baptist Houses, and Morris 2. Um, they are uh, on the street for bid. Um, it should take us about uh, four to six months on the procurement. That means advertising, getting them in, evaluating, uh, uh, doing the vendor name check, and awarding. Uh, we expect that uh, generally um, the construction, depending upon the number of boilers, so some plants have two, some have eight, you can go up, you know, range, it would be two to three and a half years for full, com full construction. One thing I do want to say is, of course, one of the first things that happens is we tie in the new uh, gas-fired mobile boilers. So consistent quality heat would be provided as soon as we get the mobile boilers tied in ahead of demolition of the existing plant. Total timeline, um, through all the sign-offs and everything, um, we hope to see um, uh, shrink from, and I'm reading this just to be accurate, generally we've run from a little over three years to five years. We're hoping to be under three years to a little over three years. And some of the ways, in, in addition to the design savings, we've, uh, DEP has offered expedited permitting uh, approvals for us, investigations. We give them a heads up notice. They will prioritize us and be out to us. Likewise, DOB has agreed to work with us to get their inspections done um, rapidly. Again, we give them heads up notice. They'll deploy the staff correctly. Uh, and we are also working with the comptroller's office around the registration process.
I would also add that uh, in order to get the boilers going, um, the city money, as you know, is on a July 1st basis. We did use federal funds to advance the designs as soon as possible rather than wait to July 1. All right, thank you um, so much. You mentioned Florentino. Um, so because they are in need of a new boiler and they have you know, some, some issues and the bid is in the street, for, can you just paint a picture for the residents? Because this process is gonna take so long, what do they do now? And I know we mentioned the hiring of new staffers, but just in closing, can you just paint a picture for the residents that there are significant needs in the developments now, and what can they um, look forward to or anticipate during this heating season? So I, I would start off with um, we are making every commitment we can for a rapid response to repairs. The reality is that 56% of our boilers are outdated and need replacement. It will be years to come before we're going to be able to replace those. But 56% 50, of the boilers we know may have interruptions in services. So that's just our reality moving forward. So what we've committed ourselves to is how can we build in through our operations and through our contractors improved response time. So that's why we've hired up more, techni more technicians who we think can help us diagnose problems more quickly, try to improve our communications, and we'll continue to enhance those digitize all of our boiler room inspection reporting so we're making sure and holding our staff accountable to do all of the checks they need to be doing on a daily basis. So all of these steps we think will contribute to improved response time for repairs. And we're, we're trying to be real straight with, with our residents about what to expect and I think we really that's another area we need to improve our communications on so that as we're entering this winter season, we're telling them, yes, your, your, your facility is on a list for repair. It's not going to happen for years. We try to provide these updates, but you know, we could probably do more to communicate with residents about what to expect. So again, we, we remain fully committed. We've built our staffing up. We've done more training. We've brought in more contractors. We have contingency plans to bring in mobile boilers, even the ones that we've placed orders for and they're being made. If something occurs next month and we need a mobile boiler, we have an emergency contract that can deliver within 24 hours a mobile boiler to us that we can um, get installed. Our staff are trained, know how to do the mobile boiler installations. So we feel like we have built contingencies, you know, increased in all the areas that we could within our current um, budgets. Okay. So in closing, we were off to a, a rough start at the beginning of this hearing, and we were also just off to a rough start um, just being able to deliver to some of the residents heat and hot water and water um, over the past couple of weeks. And from the testimony today, we were off to a rough start with the third party vendor just over the past couple of weeks. And so I would really hope that this is an opportunity to continue the lines of communication between the council as well as the residents so that we can figure out a way to work together to be able to articulate what's happening. And it starts with the transparency and accountability. It starts with the transparency of the websites, right? To make sure that those are accurate and we know what's going on, we know what's happening because we're all in this together. We're all public servants and we're here to serve the people. And so I just hope that even with the rough start, we can figure out a way to make sure and ensure that the residents have a clean and decent place to call home. And when Ms. Newman from Legal Aid mentioned the rent abatements, and then it came up again from my colleagues in the comments, 
NYCHA is a landlord and, the, and, and leases were signed. And there is a warranty of habitability. And so this is related to that, providing families with heat and hot water and water. And so that's another conversation that we do need to have because families are paying their rent 94%, there's a 94% rent collection rate. And so we really have to figure this out together. So I just wanna thank you for coming. I wanna thank you for um, staying and, and um, being able to have this discussion. We have a ton of other questions that were not asked. And so we will send these to you um, for answers and just some follow up throughout the course of the past several hours. So thank you so much for being here and we're gonna get to the next panel. And um, hopefully, I'm not sure who's gonna stay, but just let us know who's gonna stay from NYCHA throughout the rest of the hearing. Thank you so much. So the next panel we'll hear from Douglas Davis, Karen Blondell, and Robert Creamer, or Robert Creamer. And Assembly Member Rosenthal left too. Yeah, she left a long time ago. Assemblywoman, wait, okay. So Robert Kramer and Douglas Davis, and that's the only um, cards that we have left. So this will be the last panel. Mr. Davis? Are you Mr. Davis? Mr. Davis? Okay. Thank you. And who's staying from the administration? Okay. Thank you, Mr. Davis. I know you've been here a while. It's been a very interesting and productive day. It's wonderful to be here. You can just state your name again. Uh, Doug Davis. And you're from? Um, Fasonic. Okay, you can bring in your testimony. Yeah, I just wanted to uh, maybe uh, comment on a few things and maybe in an act of transparency and discovery, which I think this whole process is about, is just to uh, maybe at some future date uh, have uh, Vito and Nightshake just comment on, actually this slide is a, a wonderful depiction of the budget and where the funds come from to operate. Uh, just yesterday, there was an announcement of a, a new $100 million energy service contract, which I, I'm assuming may or may not be in this figure, but maybe to talk a little bit about the process that uh, NYCHA used to award that contract. I think it could be transformative to the replacement of these 50 some odd boilers that all have to be replaced and to maybe uh, make sure uh, the committee is uh, fully versed on what, what is in the contract because it will eventually result in uh, larger um, energy savings, of course, but also much bigger contracts for the eventual upgrade and replacement to all this, you know, heating system, which is clearly in need of, of both people and funding to move forward and make it a more reliable system. I think a lot of the comments we heard today uh, were good, interesting uh, dialogue, but you know, clearly the, the, the problem here isn't necessarily a technical one. I, I think we all can uh, feel comfortable that in this day and age we know how to design and operate boiler systems. It's clearly been a, a management and a funding problem, and I just thought this might be something that the committee could explore with this new energy service contract to make sure that it's gonna bring them to the point where we all need to be to not have to talk about the deficiencies of the system uh, in another five years. If you don't mind, can you, can you just explain what you mean by that? Like how would it be beneficial? 
because I'm not an energy person. So that would be sure. very helpful to explain what's happening. What's this? Um, explain the 100 million that you're re you're referring to. Yeah. Again, I, I would actually think I can just give you an overview of how an energy service contract works in normal places like the federal government and universities. That'd be helpful. Um, but I, I would really recommend Vito talk specifically about because he was mentioned in the article yesterday or in the, in the press release. But in general, what an energy service contract is, is you have a large operating cost of some sort of facility and you're going to spend, you know, because you spent it in the past, a certain amount to own and operate that system from an energy standpoint. And as technology gets more efficient, modern methods are developed to produce heating systems. You can basically say, wait a minute, I'm going to, I replace 53 boilers over the next couple of years. I'm going to have a quantum leap in energy savings because technology is better today than it was 20, 30 years ago. And you can award an energy service contract, which would basically be paying someone to uh, design and fund the planned replacement of X efficiency to something better and uh, the results in lower operating costs, which means the pie here changes. And you know, normally an energy service contract, our federal government does it all the time. Uh, states are deploying these things. Even private entities will use energy service contracts to kind of pay for the replacement and upgrade of their facilities based on reduced operating costs over the next 20, 30 years. So a $100 million NYCHA contract, to, I, I believe the vendor is, is Amoresco, um, would be a benefit if it goes well because the, the pie here gets smaller in the future and you pay for these upgrades out of energy savings. Uh, I think the real goal, I think, of transparency is to make sure the leadership here understands the process, what was in the original $100 million contract because it's obviously going to be instrumental to the future success of being able to deliver heat and hot water to residents. So it's, it's something that I think is an, an important thing and, and the timing's right because obviously I, I think this contract was awarded in large part because there's a dire need here and we need to fix the system and move forward and pay for it in some manner. So uh, to me it's a great opportunity but it certainly is probably a, a more important discussion for you to understand than you know, how to uh, test a boiler or you know, hire a person. That's, that's management stuff. This is uh, the future of New York City's housing program. Okay, I appreciate that. Thank you. And I would love to, to follow up to have another conversation. I look forward to that. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you. We have, for the record, testimony from Assemblymember Helen Rosenthal, testimony from Legal Aid Society, testimony from Fifth Avenue Committee, and that is all testimony we received for the record. So that will conclude our public housing hearing today on preparing for the winter, heat and hot water at NYCHA developments. Thank you, everyone.